Well, hello, folks. It's uh, it's Friday, so I'm here. <laughs> Let's see what we missed here. While I was in the little shares, oh, there's some hellos. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hello, cute. Hey, what's up, you doing? Boy. How are you doing? Oh, I can see it's a little low. There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, a little tired lately, um, but otherwise kind of okay. I uh, uh, yeah. I was supposed to. I'm supposed to be like taking it easy and feeling, and instead I find things I'm supposed to do. Um, <laughs> well, I'm supposed to go down and do some plumbing for my mother, so. <clears throat> You know, no rest for the wicked and all that. Nice, yeah, well, really appreciate you uh, taking the time every Friday. Um, I'm just about to actually go have dinner with my grandmother, so I'll have to come back in a bit, but I look forward to talking with you later. Yeah, I'll, I'll be here for a few hours. All right, take care. What are you doing? Oh. <clears throat> My plump old man has been turning into a real lap cat. Hello. I want to see you. Yes. <clears throat> Problem with Socrates as a lap cat is that he's fidgety. Like, it's not, he doesn't just curl up. He, he stands on you, walks around, rubs into everything, bumps into you, sits for a moment, then gets up and starts the whole process over again. Bump, 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 bump. You know. Yes, the old man. Ah, <clears throat> uh, let's see. <clears throat> ah, hello, Anna. Hello, Stroop. Hello, Calabrian. Muse is there. Anna's there. Anna, was that? <clears throat> I was uh, scrolling through, sending little uh, share things out, and some. It looked like somebody had JBS's picture. I thought it was you, but it doesn't show it there. Maybe it was a TikTok glitch. It's like, who would steal GBS's picture? But there's, there were two of him. <laughs> Which seemed weird. Hi. No one wants to see your ass. What are you doing? Oak. Oak. No one wants to see your ass. What are you doing here? Meow. <clears throat> yes, hello. Ugh, surrounded by cats. Oh, it did to you as well, Anna. Okay, so it, it's just some weird glitch. I thought maybe there was some reason that someone was using a, a picture or something or other, but no, as soon as I see 
Not in here, clearly that didn't happen. Hello, Kimberly. Uh, uh, uh yes, hello. Bum. Oh, look at this. Big fat gray log here. Ugh. It can't sit still. He <clears throat> can't sit still. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, there's this bird. I'll kind of get behind up here. But, uh, oh, finally a little guest request there. Let's see, let's hit a couple of these. Boom, and boom. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, hey, guys, how's it going? Hi, Anna. Hello. Yeah. I cannot taste anything or smell anything, but I'm here. Oh. <clears throat> and as usual, I'm here for a few minutes while I am getting ready for the shutdown of Saturday. Um. <laughs> But, you know, nice of you to, to, to stop in, you know. <laughs> uh, I actually did ha ha think of a question, though. I'm like, usually my fr by Friday, I feel like my brain is just, like, blanking on everything. But I was like, oh, actually, I do have a question. Um, I don't even know when it was. It was, like, a week or two ago, maybe. Um, I know they, there was a bunch of people talking about how um, the gov the courts in Israel, um, they changed, they finally like blocked laws that were or they blocked that had allowed Haredim not to serve in the army it's like this ongoing thing that's been going on for at least like a decade or two um <laughs> so um i was just i i had heard that like it was the they had finally made their final like okay you really have to serve do you and there were protests about it do you think that that will affect the political climate there at all or do you think it's just kind of like another red herring um, i don't know <laughs> i suspect honestly that there's still going to be enough pushback from government and they'll still find a way around making it compulsory uh, especially since the right-wing governments um well really most governments it's been pretty rare without have, have always depended upon Haredi votes uh, and keeping those parties in coalition uh and while they've compromised in a number of ways. There are a, a bunch of um, volunteer groups uh, and there are efforts to recruit people who sort of like wash out of yeshiva, I guess, um, and don't do as well. But making it compulsory is, I think, um, something that those parties are still going to fight. And if they're fighting it, I have a hard time seeing that it'll get implemented. We've actually had several times before where decisions like that have been made actually laws I remember <laughs> say it is now required and the law passes and somehow magically never actually goes into effect or changes anything at all there's always a way around it i definitely thought under lapide for that brief moment in time that something might happen but it didn't um but i had heard that the difference might be with the right-wing parties being that the during the current situation that they have enough support from other people outside the Haredim, but they don't necessarily need their votes for that, and they need people who want the Haredim to serve. Um, I'm not sure if there's any reality to that or not, you know, but... I mean, honestly, if if, um, if Shas or, or United Torah Judaism drops out of the coalition, I don't think they've got enough to hold it together, really. So really? They would push another election in and um, they would I, for sure do it they would for, for sure drop ut absolutely shots i, I have no idea what to that's the, that's the if, they, if they threaten that um and then it throws things into another election then that that causes all kinds of chaos people don't really want right now so it, it's just there's gonna be a lot of horse trading behind the scenes and we'll see how things actually play out but but yeah i'm, I'm always interested by that gosh what was it called um this was ages ago it wasn't shinui was it I'm totally blanking on the name, but there was a political party for a while in Israel formed specifically around this issue only. They were like a, a one-issue party. We want to draft these guys and stop the exemptions. I, 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 I know what you're talking about. I completely am also blanking, but I remember hearing about it. I, but yeah, there, it's been a push for many decades now, um, especially as um, their population keeps growing faster than any other. Um, and there's a lot of um, resentment about... Uh, 
the amount of state welfare that has to go to them because you I mean, in every other Jewish community around the world, there are always people who don't have to, you know, quote unquote, get a real job, like being a scholar isn't a job. But I mean, like the community is going to support some people who are going to study Torah and are going to provide the answers and provide your kind of rabbinical class. There's, there's, every community does that. But Israel is the only place where, there, where about 50% of the Haredi population never get a job. Are you sure it's really 50% mm -hmm. now? What was that? Are you sure it's really 50% now? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I feel like my understanding is that's changed a lot over at least the last decade. Um, certainly, it's I know- a little bit, but uh, last I saw the numbers were still pretty close, but I don't know, I, I, I'd have to look right now to see what the exact- In percentage. Jerusalem, I believe that. I feel like in Bnei Brak and the other cities where you do have more of a shift, where they're more, I don't, don't wanna say modern, but it's becoming more acceptable to do other things. <laughs> Thank God. Acceptable. It was just that people wanted to be able to do that, and, and there was a, a whole rationale that um, uh, the prayers are protecting the state, so they're doing good service that way. But it, it started actually with a lot more women having to work, uh, and that's gone up considerably. So I'm, I'm thinking mostly about Haredi men. Um, a lot of women are having to crank out six kids and still work at a convenience store just to make the bills because. Um, since the uh, the 1980s and the neoliberal turn in Israel, there's a lot less, I guess, money for these things. So um, a lot of people have been feeling the pinch on that in terms of the the welfare and whatnot. So um, I don't know what, what, the, what the number is right now for men, but it was around 50% for a long time. But the number of women in the workforce has been going up steadily for quite a while, too, which is, it, it just, I don't know, it, to me, it's just unbelievably fucked up to make somebody raise a ton of kids and be the only one who works but that's just me yeah it's interesting i mean i, I knew that the women has gone up but i didn't really think about the kind of numbers like that but it, it's definitely interesting and i just kind of it i know it, it's like a micro issue but it for certain people it's a bigger issue so i kind of wonder mm. how that applies affects the political climate overall if at all and uh the ongoing you know, we should we should look into uh, the, the the current numbers today. I haven't paid attention for quite a while, but um, the it was a huge research project for a while. It was actually going to be uh, looking at the um, the impact of um, Haredi communities in the West Bank and their changing um, socio political ideals was actually my original dissertation topic. Um, but in the West Bank, one. yeah, yeah. Well, looking at like the the growth of you know, tons of um, specifically Haredi settlements all across the West Bank, like yeah, Beitar, you mean? Um, yeah, ones, ones a little close by, yeah, things like Modi and Ili, but also things that are further in, that are, um, that are either mixed, um, modern and ultra-Orthodox, um, you know, there's, but yeah, there's, there's actually a significant number of, um, uh, Haredi neighborhoods in the West Bank, and my interest was how is that altering the, the political landscape for them? I, I started seeing, um, Haredim waving Israeli flags at protests uh, and supporting settlers, which is not what they were like decades ago. Um, and there, and increasingly, a lot of them were supporting the um, uh, the secular right wing parties as well. So it was looking at what wow. was what the impact on them. How is it changing their own like socio political identity? Um, that was uh, that got me into it, and as well as like what is the um, I guess the the physical and cultural impact of the growth of those communities uh, in the West Bank, where again the state is dumping in tons of money to build whole neighborhoods to attract more people in, and originally it was like, oh yeah, we'll go wherever the, the housing is cheap because we need cheap housing for our big families. But increasingly, a lot of them were like really like I was at a um, a protest in Sheikh Jarrah many years ago, and there were Haredim that were out there waving the flag and supporting the settlers who were taking houses and chasing um, Palestinians out of houses in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, it's uh, yeah. not really how we were taught to think about no. them at all. Um, so I've got a bunch of um, um, works by Israeli sociologists and anthropologists looking at the, the changes there. But I I haven't much had my, my <laughs> a toe in that field, so to speak, for quite a while. Um, you know, since uh, when this is uh, back in the um, 07, 08 financial crash um, and all the grant money dried up. So I was like self-funding, you know, continuing archival work um, yeah. in Israel. Uh, 
and I just ran out of cash to do is fuck. I gotta find something cheaper I can do. <laughs> it doesn't involve me spending months at a time living here. Um, Fair but, point. But yeah, that was um, yeah. That's quite a few years back now, but um, it was it was fascinating to see how much those communities have been changing and, and a lot of the internal dynamics around it. But yeah, I'm definitely out of touch. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't real I didn't realize you did your dissertation on that. That's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a, a I got a big ass pile of um of material on that that I, I someday want to be able to afford to go back and, and finish and turn into a, man, a manuscript, but I ended up having to switch topics because the uh, the you know, the funding issues were too complicated. There, there's still um there's still a chunk of material that I need, and there's a few places I I, I couldn't get into. Like I I, I have some really funny stories about <coughs> trouble I ran into with with settlers. Like there are places I couldn't get into at all. Like being being turned around. Like I'm I'm like trying to con my way into the, the the settlement of Emmanuel. Can I, hi, I just want to like look around. I'm, I'm totally harmless. I mean, look at me, I'm totally harmless. You know, like, don't, don't mind me. I'm just a tourist or whatever. And they're like, mm, no, we, we're, we're very suspicious of you. You're not allowed into our city. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot of places where um, I, I wanted to, um, uh, to go and still see things, interview people and whatnot, as well as um, a chunk more archival material. I did a, a ton of the stuff that I could do at... Um, um, Hebrew University's archives, but um, uh, and then uh, there was a, a chunk also in um, um, an archive in Tel Aviv. But I, 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 there's a, there's several other places I needed to get to for you know looking through the um, like the legal interactions, how things have changed that way, their relationship with the state. So uh, oh, is a lot of that. <laughs> but I'm I'm way I'm way out of that for now. A lot of that, pro I mean. I would think that that would be hard research because I feel like a lot of that is not necessarily going to be documented, like on top of overboard. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of um, behind the scenes horse trading for sure. Um, things like that you have to get out of um, people's um, a lot of a lot of diaries and whatnot get get preserved and it gets saved that way, so you get to see some of the changes over time. But um, it's uh, but no, there are. <clears throat> There are still places where I need to connect what I know about the the sociological changes to the political climate, and you know, tying in some of that. And, and there are things that are documented about, like in the end, like a lot of the negotiations among among parties and within governments, all that kind of stuff does get saved. I mean, Israel does have a freedom of a freedom of information act, and weirdly enough, it's honestly easier to get approval for some things to be declassified there than it is in the u.s that is um, really weird and unexpected just, yeah it's it, it just that most people don't ask <laughs> you know some things they're, 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 are, are problematic but there's a lot of material that's been declassified and then they just count on the fact that no one's bothering to look at it or listen to the scholars who are using it this is one of the things that actually i mean look at the the whole rise of the new historians from the 1980s and whatnot you know, when people like Ilan Pape started writing this shit, they're writing it because of declassified documents. And what happens? Uh, he's chased out of the country, essentially. I mean, he was getting death threats, you know, like, just they, they all leave. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's not enough interest. I mean, you, you can't walk into a Stymotsky anywhere and find books critical of the state. They, they're just not there. You can find them in, like, university libraries. But it's just not... You probably find some in, like, the back alley of the Meisharim, but yeah. <laughs> And they, they, they definitely have their own literature. I, I have so many funny photos of like um, Zionism is teaism and all kinds of stuff on the on, on the walls that, you know, that in Meisharim. Uh, there's there's some people in there are extremely hostile towards the state. Yes, to say the least. <laughs> but I mean, like I'm, I'm just mainstream Israeli society doesn't really care about a lot of those issues. So the the, the declassifications honestly don't really threaten the state at all. So they, it, it's generally pretty easy to put requests in and get stuff out. So there's actually tons of material that has been uh, collected, but again, most people don't go there. You need, you know, you know, uh, to make um, reservations or whatever, like you know, get appointments to go in and sit there, and then you, you know, and then you're like combing through boxes, of documents. It's a, it's a laborious process. I mean, archival research is no fun. <laughs> it's just I hear that. I mostly deal with like histo. I don't do anything modern at all, um, but I, I definitely hear that. 
Very yeah, cool. and, 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 the, and the trick with that project too is it's it's um it's what they call a history of the present it's looking specifically at what are the changes in the last 40 years um you know up to to now <clears throat> and that does get there are certain challenges when you're dealing with like stuff in the last decade or two um so anyway I, i've got a i got a piles and piles of um of notes and documents and whatnot here from that project, but it was abandoned a long time ago. But I am, I, I was very interested in um, the Israeli Haredi community. I just, I can't keep up with it enough and, <clears throat> since then. But yeah, I, I'll, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, my suspicion is going to be people will find a workaround because it's too, it, it's a, it's a political hand grenade no one really wants to deal with. Uh, Fair but enough. It's a, eventually it changes. You know, I, I think that in the long run, it, it won't be possible to sustain, especially since the the shift toward neoliberal economics. Israel is simply not going to be able to afford to splash out the way they have done. Um, and that's eventually going to force certain changes in the community as a whole. And the conscription is going to be one way of trying to integrate the community much more into society as a whole and therefore ultimately into the economy. So I think that it's going to happen no matter what. It's just a question of, of when. When, um, do you know when they started having like the Hardal units, even though those aren't really for Haredim necessarily, but um, I remember. When, they, when they, they started having the, 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 those IDF units? Sorry? You, you mean when they started having the, the, the Orthodox units in the military? Yes. Uh, uh, d on some level, it goes back almost to the start, but um, the kind of ones that are specifically targeting Haredim are much more recent. Well, only only in the last you know, thirty years or so, that, I mean, and, and picking up steadily since. And like, there's more and more, you know, trying to draw more and more people in. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, great. Thank you. <laughs> plenty of them when you know when, when i was actually doing research there back in you know 08 um uh and sadly enough the the reports that do get saved about them and this is another thing that shows up <laughs> more recently in archives too uh they're some of the most trigger happy units stationed in the west bank which is sad um because historically the israeli haredi communities um were more pro-Palestinian as a whole, and I, I don't, I, I don't mean just like some of the hardcore, but I mean like just in general, they, they didn't have a problem with Palestinians. But since the second Intifada, um, there's been a market shift, um, and in the last twenty years or so, um, there's some genuinely violent uh, Haredi units out there. I mean, they, they have been repeatedly filmed literally stoning people, which is just weird. I, do you think that they're really still when they're joining these units? Do you still kind of do you still really classify them as Haredi, or do they become then more like the um, Dati Lumi by definition? I mean, if they're, as long as they're still integrated into their communities. But I mean, are they? I guess that's my question. Are they? Yeah, when, I, I think they are, and I think that's part of the general shifts overall in terms of like the uh, again the the general shifting political climate. Um, you go back, you know, <laughs> 40 years or so, and it's a whole different ballgame where today in Haredi communities all over Israel, people are like, they're flying the flag outside their house. They're like, they're draped outside the house. Like they're identifying much more strongly with the state and yet are still part of the community. So the community, I think, is a bit more tolerant of it. Now, again, certain groups of them, definitely not, <laughs> right? Just like, yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to like serve serve there and then like hang out with Nethery Karta or something. Yeah. But, but like, um, but I think well, the, the it probably depends on are still a bit more tolerant of. I, I'm wondering what the shift it like the percent. I know that there anyone who's who is would be serving would have to be aligned with the, the their specific group would have to be aligned with the Aguda Israel. Um, what's the other group's name? I'm blanking right now. The Ada Haredis. For sure, they couldn't still be integrated by like the Ada Haredis if they were serving. There would be no way. I mean, yeah. I'm, they, I'm, do they even vote? I don't even know if they vote. There, there are a lot more who do. And again, once right. actually, not not only are voting for their their the own Haredi parties, but increasingly for the secular parties as well. It's it's, it's a 
but it, it's a rapidly shifting climate right now, which is one of the things that drew me into it in the first place, was the changes that were taking place right then <laughs> that we were watching. Um, so it's uh, it's really hard to, to say right now. And again, I'm uh, I, I, I'm at least a decade out of um, uh, out of touch with a lot of the the details. Like it's been a while since I've actually pulled up the current sociology journals and whatnot to see what people are talking about now. Um, but the, uh, the the shifts already by then, by you know, 10, 15 years ago, were were quite remarkable. Um, uh, so it's. It's it's hard to say, and and even there, there's so much fragmentation in the different communities. I mean, everyone just has their own little thing still. They're they're all still remembering all their different connections back to the parent countries and everything else. But even there, that um, that history of fragmentation in Israeli Haredi society has been in sharp decline, uh, and people are more and more connecting into a, a broader Israeli identity. I, I, have, I have literally seen Ethiopian Haredim um, uh, in Israel um, who have chosen to integrate into that community entirely. And, um, and it, it was actually very difficult for me to find Yiddish speakers. Like just wandering around the streets, you know, like listening everywhere. I, I was hearing Hebrew everywhere. Um, you would only probably find in Yerushalayim. Even there, walking in the streets of Meishar, I mostly hear Hebrew. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, you could, I could going out of my way. I found people who did speak it, <laughs> but a lot of the conversation on the street wasn't Yiddish anymore. Um, Interesting. It, it is. It is shifting, and I think a, a lot of that is is just it's building a kind. It's it's developing its own distinct um, Israeli character. I think um, in the communities as a whole. And that's where it, it gets to be, I think, very interesting as a topic is that it is such a, um, a fluid, um, evolving situation. So. Very cool. And thank you for and, uh, humoring my niche question. <laughs> <laughs> While we're on this topic, um, someone was hoping to, if you could clarify or if you knew who created that shift that you guys are talking about, or if it, there was one person responsible for the shift in the Haredim community. Oh, oh no, 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 there's, there's no, there's no person or thing responsible for it. It's just, okay. Think, think of it this way. The communities are there already. So you've got like the old issue of communities, there's already traditional communities, and then a whole bunch more um, displaced East Europeans, Holocaust survivors, things like that. People are settling in. So there's a growing um, uh, Haredi uh, population inside Israel. And the state decides that it wants to um, count on their support for things. This is actually one of the reasons that Israel doesn't have a constitution. Um, ben Gurion's faction did not want to work with the secular far right, so instead they they cut a deal with the uh, um, with the Orthodox Jews uh, to get their votes, um, and then support a kind of like status quo, whatever. We'll just run without it and not have to compromise or whatever. But in the process of that, it starts this history of uh, of handouts to the community in order to keep their support and keep their votes and almost every coalition in israel's history has had Haredi parties in the coalition even if it, they're regardless of the ideology of the particular government because they're there in order to get those handouts for their community in order to get that support um and through that what you have then is a, con a direct connection between a community and a state which is extremely rare in Jewish history, um, having access to specific resources that, like their educational system is separate. Israel has three separate public education systems, one for Palestinians, one for secular Israeli Jews, and then the Haredi education system. They're all paid for by the government. And um, having to work with the government and interact with the government constantly in order to get the money for um, for housing, food, education, everything else means that they're constantly engaged with society in a way that a lot of um, the so-called ultra-Orthodox communities usually are not. Um, they usually want to kind of exist apart and do their own thing. We're not going to bother you if you don't bother us. Everything's cool. But here they're, they're actually tightly enmeshed within the entire political framework. And I think that simple fact 
has led them to engage with the wider society and its politics in ways that Haredi communities generally do not. Um, and that over time has had consequences. It has gotten people to care a lot more about the politics. It's also opened them up to tons of propaganda. Um, so there's a whole lot of work done specifically by the Israeli far right to appeal to them, which is one of the reasons with the, uh, the second intifada, there's such a market shift in their attitudes too. Uh, because the, uh, the fact that the second intifada started off nonviolently was heavily suppressed in the Israeli media and it said there was massive effort to, to talk about you know everything bad about it and to, to hit back at them and then next thing you know you've got a bunch of the like the suicide bombings and whatnot and you know you know cafes and buses are blowing up and there were a lot of as usual Haredim who got caught up in that I mean you're just like you're riding the bus and the next thing you know the bus explodes and that sucks so the community started turning really hardcore against Palestinians which means that there's a lot of places where they overlap with the interests of settler parties in the Likud now, and that um, overlap has caused them to, in some ways, rub off on each other. So a lot of the historically secular Israeli far right has grown progressively more religious in the last 25 years, and the Haredi communities have grown progressively more integrated into the wider um, socio-political framework, at least on the right. Um, you know, so they're, they're influencing each other in some very interesting ways, I think. Um, but no, it's not, a, it's not a single shift driven by a, a person or an idea, it's just the constant interaction. It's just them being part of something, and that is going to have some kind of an effect in the long term. Thank you. That was a really good answer. Um, there was one more question, and then uh, I do have a general topic I want to talk about after this that I think kind of ties all of this in, maybe. Um, but I know Erica also came up, so she probably wants to say something. Um, but first, there's one question that was asking if um, Israel had started... They used the word uh, mercenary, However, what I think they meant were like private contractors um, to fight for Israel um, in Gaza. Do you know if that's happened? Um, I have heard of outside military contractors coming in, but I didn't follow up or look into it. Um, but I heard, and, and this 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 one actually honestly really confused me, given the ongoing struggle there. But I heard a group of Ukrainian. Uh, you know, mercenary figures were coming in, and there were Ukrainians who were going to be fighting, um, which just does not make sense to me. But I, um, I didn't look into it. I, I didn't. I, I didn't chase after the story to see if there was any real truth to it. Historically, um, IDF really tries to avoid that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, there are uh, some of these stories are, are interesting because there are actually a lot of people who live in Israel and are born in Israel that cannot be citizens because of the racist um, citizenship laws. So you've got a bunch of like Filipino workers that have come in and they've been working there for decades and they have kids and their kids are raised as Hebrew speakers in Israel and they, because of that, they identify with the state and want to serve. Like there, there, there's like um, there are these Filipino guys who are like, hi, can I please, can I please like. <laughs> join be a citizen whatever here and they're often like ah no it's really difficult for them actually to to get integrated that way um so it's um the keeping people like that don't belong kind of out has always been um a bit of a priority there like technically it's open for any of the Palestinian citizens of Israel to volunteer, like the ones who aren't drafted, they can volunteer, and some do. There are literally Palestinian Israelis who choose to, who volunteer and want to serve in uh, in the military, and they are heavily marginalized for it, which is a shame because it's it, it really seems like it'd be an opportunity to integrate the communities, to to work together better, to to find common ground and whatnot. But there's been a lot of effort to. Um, to ostracize the people who do, you know, because it ends up being very, very cliquish and whatnot. So it's hard for me to understand how they can make really good use of mercenaries given that kind of military culture. Um, I really, I, I can't wrap my head around how that works, but it doesn't surprise me that 
the idea would be tempting to take in outside military forces like that. So, definitely could happen, but I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, Erica, would you like to say anything before I pose the next question? Nope, go ahead. I just hope that your migraine feels better and it's really good to be with all of you tonight. So, go ahead. Hey. Yes, it's uh, Nikki with the migraine. I am thankfully migraine free. So, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I thought we had multiple migraines going on. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I typically have one though. <laughs> Got it. Okay, you you can see how I could get confused, but happy to be with all of you this Friday. Yeah, please go on with the next question. Okay, uh, Bra, who has a great name, uh, asks, is following Talmud for a Jewish person required? No. Like, literally never. Um, there are there are Jewish communities that have never even had access to it. I mean, the Ethiopian Jewish community has no Talmud. Um, not to mention, like, uh, you know, you know Karaite factions, you know, which have always been I mean, a minority but there's there, there's a chunk of there's there's tens of thousands of them in, in israel i mean they they're completely non-rabbinical jews um for uh for many forms of what we would call like the orthodox in a european or american form then generally yes outside of again like karaite factions and and again like i would consider like you know the the beta israel community to be orthodox you know when they're when they're observant but they're not orthodox in a way that um, rabbinical Jews are. Um, but there are tons of different factions within it. So just to use the American context, right? In, in, in the United States, um, there are four main groupings you can find for, for Jews. And again, setting aside, you know, um, Ethiopian Jews and, and Karaites and whatnot there, but just looking at basic Jewish communities here, uh, the, the orthodox community in the U.S., you know, whether modern Orthodox or, or Haredi, they, they pay attention to Talmud. Talmud is very important to them. The uh, conservative movement makes good use of it, but doesn't hold it as, um, as binding to the same degree as uh, Orthodox communities do. It's a little bit looser, but still very, very important to them. Reform communities use it but don't consider any of the rulings to be binding. So it's up to like individual choice, whether or not you pay attention to it. And the reconstructionists are a massive wild card because many reconstructionists are explicitly atheists. I mean, like what you choose to do and how you choose to practice your Judaism is entirely up to you. Um, so Talmud may be important, but also might not in, in any way. So it's, it's never been um, a universal thing for Jews ever at any point, but it has been very significant for especially the um, uh, European Jewish communities, um, uh, and you know, yeah. So, yeah, it, it n never been universal, but it is important. But again, whether you what you what you do, how you follow things, communities can't. Okay, so if you go back um, a couple hundred years, whatever, a little, little more than two hundred years, you look at I don't know, say eighteenth century Jewish communities around Europe. The local rabbinical court is your political authority. Like if you if you fuck up, the community is going to punish you, and they are going to impose. They are using, you know, rabbinical law in the shtetl, in the the community itself. But with the integration of Jews into the fabric as a whole, when when Jews were emancipated and granted citizenship in European countries, increasingly the the individual Jewish communities lost the ability to impose halakha on people and it became much more like in the Christian sense uh, a, a choice to follow things as opposed to something the communities uh, enforce um, this is one of the this is connected actually to the whole transformation that gets people thinking of Judaism more as a religion um, which again historically wasn't really the thing um, Judaism gets thought of much more as a religion because of secular societies and people choosing to follow a distinct religion or not however they choose where historically judaism was much more of like a, a a legal ethical civilization where those laws were imposed so go back a ways and talmud is important to a lot more of the jewish community and it's only like more vocal factions like the karaites or whatever that are like distinct from that um 
but in the last few couple of centuries, it's really kind of open the degree to which you know people follow it at all. Oh, there was a something. Uh, how was it? Uh, Hannah said uh, about the um, use of mercenaries and whatnot. <clears throat> Quite honestly, in in this as well as in almost any big situation, you know, militarily around the world, I tend not to pay much attention to uh, a lot of military type policy. Um, I have personally very little interest in in that kind of stuff. So I. I, I pick things up, but not because I'm really paying attention to it. So I'm 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 often out of touch on specific details of things. So yeah, I mean, I I follow um, things like the the Russia Ukraine war very closely in terms of the political um, aspects of it, the rhetorical like ideological aspects of it. But I pay basically fuck all attention to the the situation on the ground, the military exchanges, what hardware is being used, you know, who's launching this or that offensive. I, I pay no attention at all. So it, it's honestly very similar in the in the Gaza conflict. Um, I pay a lot more attention to the, the political situation, um, the, the ideological situation, and very, very little to what is actually, well, the, what are you supposed to call them? The boom booms and pew pews and all the rest of your infantile TikTok language. Yes, so, we've all been made into children. But I, I don't know it personally. Okay. Um, well, my first question. Oh, well, actually, first, um, Hannah said that uh, she's heard of Indians being there and um, Ukrainians being there. Uh, yeah. As well as, I mean, the United States is pretty much confirmed from the beginning to be there. Uh, and I think... Rumor was I I heard from people, but I have to say it's a rumor because it was not uh, verified. Was that they were um, a lot of the drones were U.S. made and brought in by them, and then they helped uh, fly a lot of them because um, the Israelis didn't know how to fly the U.S. drones. Um, yeah, and there's there are serious legal problems with that, so they're going to try and bury that as long as possible and then it'll come out later once nobody actually gives a shit because we're not supposed to be involved there at all but it was kind of inevitable uh, for a long time the uh, the israelis refused to allow any kind of u.s assets on their soil and we now have a we, there's a u.s military base in the northern negev um uh, so it's <clears throat> It's not surprising that we would be involved. I don't. I don't doubt it at all. But I, I haven't seen anything that we can verify on it. I think it'll be a while before we can. Uh, and yeah, I, now, that, now that you mentioned, I, I heard about Indians too. It's the same thing. I, I heard about Ukrainians. I heard about Indians, but I didn't. I didn't chase the story down um, because the the details of military operations don't really suck me in the same way. Which is like, oh, okay, well that's kind of fucked up. But but yeah, it doesn't surprise me. It just it's hard to see how they would do it, you know, and I'm not really curious enough to really look into it but right now, but I I, I I do think it would be weird for them to try and find ways to to rationalize doing that given the long military history you know, like the, the military culture that had developed there. But you know, they uh <clears throat> I can see why they'd feel a need to do it, so Okay, um Yes, the UK is reopening a base in in in, in Jordan. Well, it's been a while since they've had troops stationed there. Um, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's they they have very close security cooperation. Always have, but I but they, they haven't operated a base there in a while. Uh, the UK gave up most of its bases in the area. Mo most U.S. bases in the Middle East were originally British bases. Our, our bases in Bahrain and Qatar were originally British bases. Um, but yeah, it, it, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, Empire. All right. Well, if anyone else has a question and they would like to come up and speak, you can request. We just ask that you mute while Dr. Liam answers, and then you are welcome to um, give a response once he's done. You can also put your comment in the chat. I would be more enthusiastic, but I am big sick with the vid. Um, okay, so my first question is, I would love 
a clarification on the definition of ethnicity and if there are things that a community does that it, that um, excludes you from being an ethnicity or and then maybe we could also de define ethno religion um, I had someone say that mm -hmm. I, I, just before you go yeah. too far further the mm -hmm. second part of that I, I didn't understand at all yeah so the um, ethnicity in that, but something about something they can do to exclude or something you, you'll need to clarify that because I'm having I didn't get it at all so someone's art made the argument that you cannot be an ethno religion if you allow people to convert to your religion what <laughs> Um, Which means that Jews are excluded from being an ethno religion and an ethnicity. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Let's let's start then with ethnicity as a whole. Right. Um, we really should understand that actual genetics descent is never been part of any of these definitions. It's not part of the definition of of race, nation, ethnicity. None of them. Um, common descent is a, uh, is, is a feature of them because that's how ideas get passed along. So most people are born into a particular identity, but they're, they're never the only ones who are involved in it, or at least almost never. I mean, rare exceptions in history, and then usually there are things that are going into sharp decline and die out. Like, look at how, how much the Samaritans have almost died out, or, or Zoroastrianism is, is slowly dying. Um, because it's very difficult for the community to um, accept anyone from the outside. But ethnicity, that's, that has a specific religious aspect to it. Um, so if we set aside the ethno-religion, we can come back and we can complicate it a little bit when we add those. But if you think about ethnicity as a whole, uh, people have always been able to enter tribes, like always. And an ethnicity is basically just a way of describing um, the cultural aspects of a tribe, like what are the, the aspects of its, of its identity, where tribe as a term refers much more to the political structure, like you know, how, are they, how are they led, you know, that sort of thing. But the, the ethnicity is the cultural dimension of, of the identity. The, um, okay, so here's a, here's, a <coughs> here's a fun reference here. Um, as I remember that, uh, okay, so I'm not a big fan of Kevin Costner as an actor. I think he basically has this kind of wooden feel and seems very similar in a lot of his roles. But there are some roles that really work well for him that I liked. And uh, Dances with Wolves was one of them. Like, I thought he did a good job in the film. Set aside any problems with the film. You can like it or dislike it. Not really relevant. But think about the film for a minute because I think a lot of people did see that. Um, remember the, um, the, the gal that had been integrated in, into the tribe that are their neighbors? He meets this, like, you know, white girl or whatever that's been raised by them. She has their identity, right? She's... <clears throat> she's what is uh, I can't remember where the film was set like which tribe what location it was oh well I, I, I'm blanking on the location but either way this is somebody who's raised in it like so she's clearly part of it um, that's that's kind of what how that works you know you've got tons of examples of that give you a, one out of like I don't know just basic American history not fiction and think about the um, uh, that first um, Colony that uh, oh what's what's his name um, oh gosh I'm, I'm blanking on his rally maybe but there was a, a colony established in um, uh, North Carolina on an island um, that then collapsed because there was a war back in Europe they they didn't have the money blah 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 it took several years before they could send the next group of ships with supplies and when they got back they were all gone. Like they found this weird cryptic message on a tree in one word and no one knew what the hell happened to the community. They were just disappeared. Well, it took ages for to figure out what happened, but we found out they were integrated into the local Native American tribes. They they assimilated. They just became part of the tribe um, and just completely free. Yeah, the, the whole Roanoke settlement. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the word that was on the tree? Cro Croaton or something like that? Cro um, no. I'm having a senile moment here. Croatoan or some stupid thing. Yeah, yeah, Croatoan, that's it. Yeah, okay, I was, I was <laughs> almost there. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the Roanoke settlement disappeared. Those people all disappeared. So ethnically, they ceased to be English. And ethnically, 
they became part of the local tribes and their children would have been entirely part of that tribe. They would have not spoken English at all. They would have had no connection to English culture. So ethnically, they weren't English anymore. You know, they, that's, that's just how tribes have always worked. You know, people have always married into them. You can marry into a tribe and in, in that way you, you have a kind of hybrid identity. So you have your original ethnic identity, but you're also identifying with the tribe and connecting to that. But your kids are going to grow up in that tribe and they will have that ethnic identity. When people are saying, well, no, you also have this blah, 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 other ethnic identity. And they're thinking of ethnic identity as, as some kind of blood ancestry thing. And honestly, all that is is 19th century race science rearing its head in the 21st century. It makes no sense at all. You know, blood has fuck all to do with um with with nations and ethnicity um it's it the only way it's relevant is that the identity is usually held by a set group that raises their kids in it so it seems like it's connected to blood descent but they're always flexible people leave tribes and connect into another identity and people marry into tribes or join them or connect to them in different ways so there's always uh, a back and forth there um, uh, oh, yeah, so, so uh, was it Mercy Iambo or Lambo or something that says uh, Palestine more Jewish than Israel? Not more Jewish, but descended from Jews and Samaritans, yes. So Palestinians wouldn't have a Jewish ethnic identity, but they do have a blood descent from it. Do you see how that, how that works? Like, but your tribal identity would be Palestinian, right? Uh, people have different identities that, that, under, that, that shape who they are. Your, your blood isn't, doesn't really matter. I mean, think about the, all the, the Yahtzee stupidity about German blood. You know, a significant part of um, the population, in the, especially in the eastern half of Germany, they were, they were all Slavic speakers originally. They were Germanized. <laughs> they became German, but they weren't originally. They weren't Germanic. So what makes them more German than the Poles? Like nothing. Like if you're from like German Pomerania, like you have the same kind of Slavic ancestry as your Polish neighbors did. Uh, but they Germanized at some point. So the, the ethnic identity became German, or more finely, Pomeranian, Silesian, Prussian, whatever, you know, because German is much more recent as a broader identity. But still, like, you would have a, a German speaking ethnic identity, but your great grandparents probably didn't. And that's just sort of normal anywhere in the world. So when we're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about the cultural features, you know, of a particular group of people. Like what, what kind of like holds them together and like the social and cultural level in a kind of like tribal identity. That's, that's all it really is. And that means it mostly passes from parents to children, but children can leave the ethnic identity and other people can adopt the ethnic identity and have kids within the tribe and they will have that ethnic identity. Does that help with the first part, Anna? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Okay. The places we need to clarify yeah. anything. Is that, is that clear enough for everybody on this? Oh, there's a PBS special on, on, on uh, Roanoke. That's cool. Oh, I got to screenshot that. Um, yeah, so, since you, I, since you, you can't sa save that. But, but, yeah, I will. Just, I, mean, I, want, I want to see that at some point, too. I will. It's also that uh, American Horror Story one. <laughs> he did a whole yeah. season on it. I never finished it, though. That's neat. Oh, it's a good I, one. I was really into that show, ago, and I never saw any of it. Um, Hello, everyone. Hi, Nikita. Hello. <laughs> Again, I requested because you were talking about, like, a German identity and all of that stuff. And um, when I did my very, very detailed um, family history, blood analysis, all of that stuff, I am descended from the original Aryans who invaded India and drove the Dravidian south. So whenever a Yahtzee tells me, oh, the whole Aryan race, I'm like, this is what, this is what we look like. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's, it, it's, this is why, again, race is just stupid, you know? Um, so yeah, people, once they've settled into South Asia, over generations, you're going to darken because you're closer to the equator. No shit, that's just how it happens. Like, the, the, what makes our skin tone where it is, like, 
where with, to make it lighter or darker, it's present in all of us genetically, right? Um, but it's going to manifest based upon much more recent factors, you know, genetically. Like you know, so you move further north, you're going to gradually lighten because otherwise, it's just not good for you, you know. Uh, so over thousands of years, it shifts a little bit. But they're exactly the same people, yeah. Like so, the, the same like you know ethno linguistic groupings that scattered around that settled a whole bunch of Europe also went to Iran and India. <laughs> so a whole lot of northern yeah. India. I mean, I mean, it's it's a mix too, which is interesting. Like so much of that would have been like there would have been some blending with the with the original Dravidian populations, but also tons and tons of like you know these Aryan settlers that would have come out of Central Asia. Mm -hmm. so it would have been considerably lighter skinned, but once you're mm -hmm. further south, it's going to shift over time. Yeah, that's just when people are like making it like a racial thing that you're supposed to look a particular way, like like the whole Aryan thing is just nonsensical. Afghans are yeah, Aryan. Yes. Indians, oh, well, oh, like at least the northern half of Indians are, are, are Aryan. A lot of a lot of Pakistanis are Aryan. Uh, Iranians are all Aryan. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, um, Anna, you you forgot one gender um, for the poll is feral raccoon. <laughs> I didn't make it, but it's very important. See, see, this my my oh. gender is I'm I'm woman, but from Wish. <laughs> <laughs> I I I've been told recently that I'm supposed to pick manic pixie dream guy, so somebody's gonna put that on for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the way girl. I explained it to my, the way I explained it to my nephews is you know equatorial and like you know location wise and how our bodies are adapted to the to the way in which um we lived our lives and the things that we did and yada 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 and um one of them said <laughs> Virat, he's so smart he's like so basically the printer is um at the at the equator and it just the further north you go the more that the printer runs out of ink <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. It, it's it's just a matter of toner. Like from now on, melanin yeah. is gonna be toner for me. I'm gonna think of it as like laser jet toner. <laughs> <laughs> but whenever people say, "Oh, you don't look forty," I'm like, "Thanks, it's the melanin and not being racist." <laughs> Yeah, I, I think being a terrible person tends to make you age faster. <laughs> oh yeah, they found so much. Yeah, no, it's um, uh, the whole, the whole, the, the way, the degree to which 18th and 19th century race science is still reflexively taken seriously by people bothers me. I mean, it's it's the same thing you, you get over and over again. Like, oh well, uh, oh, black people can't be racist against black people. Are are you fucking kidding me? You're you're assuming then that like something in their genetics sets their belief system, like their their ideology. That's not possible. You know, like ideas don't transmit through blood. I mean, it's it's no more reasonable than saying like all Jews are greedy or some stupid shit like that. Like it, it just they're they're nonsensical nineteenth century ideas that we really need to let go of. Uh, the, there's a, I mean, a huge disconnect between ethnic groups, tribal groups, all that kind of stuff there, like, you know, language groups, everything else there, and genetics. It's a whole different ballgame. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. See, I do agree with the, with the concept of, um, well, what we're fighting is white, white supremacist Christo fascism, right? That is the, the in D&D terms, the BBEG. What causes the verification thing to pop up? It doesn't. Sometimes it'll, it'll be it'll just go for six, seven hours, and never do it. And another, I think it must be mm -hmm. kept pick up on certain words. Hmm. Maybe. So, basically, as as I said in D and D terms, it's it's the big bad evil guy, is white supremacist Christo, Christo fascism, and racism as a concept, as an institutionalized and um, and systemic concept uh people of color cannot be racist towards white people absolutely because they white can people be, cannot experience yeah they can be they can be prejudiced you know but that, that mm -hmm. but, but but not not racism in any kind of like cultural or systemic or, or, or legal sense yeah mm -hmm. but like i have experienced where indian people from india are very much separatist to 
uh, Indians from South Africa. And that um, darker skin, well, th there's colorism and there's definitely classism and there's tribalism in, in a sense. But like to say that, to, to put down racism to its absolute basic, um, it is prejudice of one group, one racial group over another. That is completely misunderstanding the, the history of race and why it was created, how it was created, and what purpose it serves within society. Yeah. And to say, you know, anybody can be racist, it's like, yeah, you can be, anybody can be prejudiced. Absolutely anybody can be prejudiced. And right. you have to understand the nuances within each group. And yeah, colorism does fall under the racism umbrella, but it's still colorism. Yeah, like we have um, we have so many subtle shades here, and this this honestly confuses a lot of the right wingers because if you flip open a dictionary and you look up racism, it's thinking that individual that the, the distinct groups of people have dis defining characteristics, and that some are better than others. That that's basically that's it. It doesn't mention power relations at all. But when we talk about these things in sociology, when we talk about these things in history, we're using a much more nuanced language here, and racism is tied to the. European invention of a specific concept of race. Now, people have understood like different types of, I mean, the Romans were prejudiced against Syrians. There's always been like racist type concepts, but um, the racism that we deal with now is a very specific early modern origin, and it's tied into a, a whole architecture of, of, um, of white supremacy in Europe. So racism in the sense of colonial societies like yours and mine, <laughs> right, and in Europe, it has a very specific meaning that's a bit different from the generic dictionary kind of definition of it. And yeah, we have to throw in, okay, different types of bigotry, colorism, things like that. Yeah, I've, um, in, in Southern California, I've run into um, uh, people in the Hispanic community that are like super colorist, like you have to be X shade darker to be considered truly Hispanic. If you're like some white Hispanic, you're not really one of us. Kind of like, are, really? Like, I mean, whatever. I mean, I I literally know people from Mexico that grew up entirely in Mexico and came here as adults, and they're like gingers with Scottish names because hello, Mexico is an immigrant country like anything else. So like, their family had been in Mexico for two hundred years. But they were of Northern European origin originally, but they're Mexican, right? But I run to people that are like, you're not really Hispanic. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, so on one hand, dictionary definition wise, that's a kind of racism. But in terms of our analysis, it makes no sense to use that term because racism is about power relations more than anything else. So it, in terms of like color, it's a lot more useful there. Yeah. Hannah. Um, that is absolutely false because there is so much racism against black people in Europe. There is so much anti-black racism and yeah, anybody can be Muslim. Any race can be Muslim. So don't just say that it's against Islam. I didn't, I didn't see it. Anybody who's Muslim, regardless of race, is discriminated against. But white Muslims are, t are seen to be a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, and and while technically in Islam you're not racism doesn't actually make ideological sense, you know the whole like you know Ummah is everybody whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm still Muslim racist. <laughs> it, it, it absolutely happens, yeah. you know. Yeah, and there was a, a you, you go back into the 1930s. There was a significant movement in Afghanistan to adopt like you know the Yahzi ideology and whatnot. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, yeah. it, it it exists, <laughs> but it's it's but it's it not. Exist. It, but it isn't. It isn't. Um, it doesn't make good theological sense. <laughs> like it violates mm -hmm. something. It violates a core principle. Oh, there's a there was a, a, a question. Well, before I forget, um, uh, Frozelio asked, "Arian, isn't that Caucasian from the Caucasus?" No, it's not. That was a um, uh, an 18th century misunderstanding that thought that like you know white people came from the Caucasus. They didn't. You know, like um, Caucasian, uh, Mongoloid, Negroid, uh, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, all these have disappeared. They're they're not they're 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 18th and 19th century race science terms with no actual basis in reality. Thank you, Carl von Linné. Yeah, and 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 uh, and Blumenbach oh. in Germany and tons of other people. Yeah, yeah. Come on, weird little. <clears throat> 
Do you know that the um <laughs> that the Institute of uh, Racial Biology still kind of exists at the University of Uppsala? <laughs> yeah, Carl Linnaeus no, is seen as a me, national but... hero. Yeah, Carl <laughs> Linnaeus is seen as a national hero. During 2020, the, they were protecting his statue. And of course, some of the people protecting his statue were like, you know, seeing Kyle, he's about this high. Um, yeah, doing that around the around the statue of uh, Carl Linnaeus in, in Stockholm. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, one of the funny things that happened in, in 2020, though, that somebody tried to, you know, light a certain type of um, cockatiel with on fire that it can throw it into um I, i'm i'm using tiktok friendly words here um um you know a bottle with with, with oh the okay, okay, um, okay okay sorry sorry i'm 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 super autistic here yeah. <laughs> thank you i takes yeah. me a minute <laughs> okay <laughs> hey uh um thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> hey, uh, a um, certain the, a, a cockatiel Named after a foreign minister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that okay. one. Uh, so they tried to to uh, set a, a synagogue on fire, but the synagogue had been attacked so many times that instead of the usual stained glass, they replaced it with colored plexiglass. And so the guy threw the thing seemingly into the window that he thought was made out of glass so that it would go through, but it was made of plexiglass, so it bounced back and hit him in the forehead and set him on fire. <laughs> Cue John Lennon's instant karma. <laughs> yes. It literally bounced That's... from the plexiglass. When I saw that headline, I was like, this is days after a right-wing group came over from Copenhagen into Malmö and uh, burnt Qurans in the street in Malmö. And of course, ACAB, because the police just stood around and like, you know, they were probably friends. Yeah, I mean, that uh, I love that old joke, because uh, in the US, we get those like fireman calendars. You know, why don't we have police calendars? I got I got banana on Twitter. Twitter. Because of all the, <clears throat> I got bernarded, <clears throat> I got bernarded on Twitter for saying something like that. So somebody said, you know, um, why don't policemen have their um, have their their shoots like firemen? And I said because they don't want anybody to see their <clears throat> tattoos. Yeah, we're not supposed to say that that, that word. I know. Um, okay, 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 let's test it. Can you say uh, Hakenkreuz? <laughs> I, wonder if they, I wonder if they know all the words for that. <laughs> let's see if we get, <laughs> but. But yeah, you well, can't say yes for that. But yeah, no, it's it's all the um, it's all the the tattoo, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, that has yeah. the mic. The side with, the side the the side with spider. Okay, so all all synagogues and churches and whatnot, every, everyone should like you know mosques. Everybody, they should just put like colored plexiglass everywhere. You know, <laughs> that's the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the way forward here. Like, you can't do that for for a place like you know the the Christchurch <laughs> Cathedral in Dublin. Like that stained glass is like over four, five hundred years old, <laughs> and it's still the original glass. <clears throat> yeah, there's there there have been cathedrals where they have actually replaced a, a, some of the glass there, um, and um, just they, they they save some of the old stuff that I like, put in storage or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you you could technically. I mean, it's just it's difficult to do. But I mean, look at the renovations they had to do at uh, yeah, Notre Dame. Oh, a few years ago because mm -hmm. of the fire. I mean, mm -hmm. it's entirely possible to go through and do that kind of work. You can repair these things. But but still, no one's going to huck it through like, a, you know, <laughs> it's five stories up. You know, it's it's like all the, yeah. just the normal synagogues and, and, and mosques and whatnot. Those are the ones we got to take care of. Yeah. Hey, Nikita, are you going to be up here for a bit? I need to go make some food. I am, but I don't have the power to bring people up and drop them. Okay, I'll, I'll keep my phone on me. I'll, hold on, I'll, I'll just, I can just fix that right now, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that okay. isn't. Okay, so that's, okay, that's done. 
I keep forgetting it does do it by default. I'm here. Hey. Hi, Yoka. Hi, Nikita. So, um, Pleasure to see you. So good to see oh, you. Oh, many, so many chat things I missed here. Cruising through, looking for anything important here. <laughs> somebody I tried want to, to address Hannah. The, somebody tried to Latinize the S word. <laughs> <laughs> That. That but, uh, I, I just wanted to respond to Hannah. Um, yes, I, I know that she said this a long time ago, that um, it's not the same anti-Black racism that there is in the U.S. But the bar is in hell, and Europe is limo dancing with the devil. Just to, to say that it's not as bad as the U.S. is like, you're clutching at straws here. Because... Yeah, it's it's like saying one um, unalive is slightly better than the other unalive. Yeah, they still unalive us. Yeah, um, I posted on this recently um, when, when he uh, resigned, but there was a, um, a a member of the Bundestag that resigned recently because he was of you know, black immigrant origin he was from Senegal. He moved there um, very young on, you know, to go to school and then ended up liking it and stayed, became a citizen, whatnot, and he got into politics. So, you know, he, he's well in the middle age, been there for decades and decades and decades. And he was getting, like, unaliving threats because he's black. Like, that was it. You, you're just not German. Go back to your own country or whatever. It definitely exists. And, you know, there's a lot of it. So, like, the million Afro-Germans would definitely want you to understand that Europe has a shitload of racism. But... It doesn't have, uh, I mean, again, the racism in the U.S. is born of a massively brutal slave culture, <laughs> which is a little different mm -hmm. than in Europe. There, they are prejudiced as fuck, but they were the, the, the colonizing countries, not the place where the actual slave work was happening. They were the, the, the metropole. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a different type. Of, it's a different shade of the same thing. But, but the prejudice yeah. is still. I mean, and and in places it is just as bad. Yeah, and that's why I say it's it's limo dancing with the devil. Yeah. Oh, Bree, um, they have, they have a lot. They have a lot of pew pews, all across Europe. You have. People who have tons in their pew pew safes, mm -hmm. they're just not as open about it. There's no kind of thing as open carry, you know, all of those, you know, it, it's just not the same pew pew culture as in, yeah, exactly. in the it's US. The but now, you'll have families in Norway. But, mm -hmm. what? but you'll have a family in Norway, they will have 40. Pew pews between four people. Yeah, it's it, it's um it's overall not quite as widespread. Um, the, the the absolute numbers are higher here. Um, and generally the number per person. I mean, there's there's a lot more than there are than there are people in this country, but um, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot in Europe. I mean, the Swiss love them, <laughs> the Germans love them, mm -hmm. Icelanders love them, Norwegians love them. There, there there's there's a massive hunting culture. Swedes. Yeah, but, but 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 you Speaking don't have people like <clears throat> people Speaking of the Swiss. They have, uh, if I recall correctly, they have this uh, uh, festival. Uh, I think it's once a year, mm -hmm. yes. and you know the Swiss. They drink a lot. So what they do is they yeah. take all their their pew pews and they have at it. You know, and no issues. Nobody pew pews. Nobody. They go home, like their culture as the. The sister uh, Nikita said earlier, they have that culture. It's just underground. Like you don't see it as flagrant as we have it here in the U.S. And and there are a few things that restrain it because there are you you actually have to be like qualified to have them. You have to know how to store them and protect them so people yes. aren't unalive by their dogs, which happens in the U.S. because people store things properly or their toddlers are doing it. Um, and Switzerland also has, I mean, their military is conscript based. So everyone actually has military training as well. So it's, I mean, honestly, there are so many complete idiots just sticking loaded ones all over their freaking house in the U.S. It just doesn't make any damn sense. 
I wanted to welcome. Oh, I'm so sorry, Nikita. I just wanted to officially welcome Alliances up to the panel. Um, Alliances. Thank you have, yeah, thank you. Do you have a specific question for Professor Liam? Uh, no, not really. Um, well, there was something you guys were talking about earlier that came to my mind, but I somehow forgot about it. I don't know why. I can drop down. It's okay. Thank you. No. More than welcome okay. to stay. I just wanted to make sure that yeah. if you had a specific question, um, that we address it and wanted to officially introduce you to the panel. So uh, welcome. Thank, happy you. thank you so much. Very sweet of you. You're welcome, Habib. So, um, and every now and then in Europe, hello, kitty. Oh my goodness. I realize that if you want to kidnap me, you just pull up in a van with kittens. Yeah. Say, Come inside and get cuddles, and I, I'm I'm gone. Yeah, that's cute. Come to yeah. the dark side. We have kittens. Instead of an ice cream truck, <laughs> just a van You're full of kittens. Baby. <laughs> yep. Oh, look at the back. She's so precious. Yeah, Gray. She is so precious. She's grown but, so um, too. Mm -hmm. They grow so fast. She's 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 already changed a bit in a month. Mm -hmm. But um, every now and then, even though Europe is a little bit better than the U.S. in many things, um, you'll have somebody like Anders Breivik. Yeah. And if you don't know who Anders Breivik oh is, um, he is somebody who basically walked out into the street in Oslo and unalived 77 people. Actually, it, to right in the like he, he yeah. picked off a whole bunch of them and then went to another location and, and carried it. Yeah, I mean, it's just horrifying. And his manifesto was like a modern cru call for crusades. You know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. it is some really cringy racist. Shit. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And it was not just anti uh, anti Muslim. It was uh, anti black. It was anti immigrant as as completely, like it wasn't just Yahtzee rhetoric. It was this modern Yahtzee rhetoric that was that took so much else, and just put it into what would Yahtzeeism look like if it was still around in its original form today. That right. is what Anders Breivik's manifesto looked like. And the degree to which it actually looks like old mainline Christianity, too, is this scary. You know, there are some really cringe aspects of old European Christianity that are still there that we just mm -hmm. refuse to deal with, refuse to talk about, you know, just sweep under the rug. You know, oh, no, that's all that's the past. Oh, those, 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 those weird people. Like, no, like, there's a reason things like the Klan happened. And uh, like, I mean, you you look at organizations like the Klan. You look at people like Anders Breivik. You look like you look at people who like the the person who went into the the mosque in uh, Christchurch. Um, and it's just like you look at the right wing pipeline that we see on social media, and it starts out like that. You know, it starts out like that. Um, Andrew Tate right wing pipeline. It starts out with that that echo chamber kind of vibe. And I actually have a friend who wrote a, a paper on toxic masculinity and the right wing pipeline in echo ch in online echo chambers. And you'd actually like quite like the research. He's trying to get it published right now, but like and how similar it is to those beer halls mm -hmm. in the late nineteen twenties, early nineteen thirties. Yeah, it was the, the same thing. The degree to which uh, misogyny, for example, was a core feature of Mussolini's appeal and Mustache Man's appeal. You know, I will put the women back in the kitchen. I will get them out of the workforce so they don't have to compete with you. You know, so yeah, that's mm -hmm. where your Andrew Tates are doing that job, you know, like, or your Sargon of Akkad YouTuber ships, you know, like it starts off with the mm -hmm. anti-feminist discourses and then, oh, it's the anti-immigrant stuff. And then like, oh, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not against immigrants. I'm just opposed to illegal immigrants. <clears throat> and then it starts off slowly. And then the next thing you know, it's, 
I mean, you just you just scratch the surface, and then you know, and so, suddenly it's like, oh, you know, like uh, all the same kind of like, I don't know, you know, uppity, and you're one of the good ones, and all the like the the same racist shit just bubbles up to the surface. It's all there, you know. It just mm-hmm. it, the stuff has never really gone away, uh, and we we just yeah fool ourselves thinking that it has and that these are just some occasional disturbed strange people I, it, it bothers the hell out of me that we talk about uh, lone wolves all the time in the u.s and we don't deal with them for what they are ideological theists mm-hmm. um so one of the uh, discord servers that i'm in well the main d- server that i'm uh, most active in um <laughs> You laugh at the name, uh, Prof. We're called the Horny Emotional Tears. <laughs> and everybody has a name, like, connect connected to some sort of either tongue-in-cheek teaism or whatever, and my name is Joe Biden. And uh, in my name in the server is, it's, it's now changed to God Emperor Joe Biden. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all those like God Emperor Trump memes and all you know, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also, I mean, if if you follow Warhammer Forty K, <laughs> I mean, we're living in Warhammer, which is without the space Yahtzees. I mean, without the space part. That's it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. take take away the spaceships, and it's yeah, <laughs> and, and and we we still have the 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 Yatis. It's just like, uh, heaven forbid, they learn how to make people immortal and into Astartes. <laughs> Grace says they're spacey, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love you, Gray. Definitely spacey. Yep, Benimaru. Yep, the Imperium of Man. I'm really kind of. Um, I'm not sure if I should be concerned at all, but the 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 Daniel in the chat talking about legal versus illegal immigration and all that. I I, I want to make sure that isn't actually a, like a really bad. I mean, I don't know. It's it makes me nervous. Oh, let me see. I'll try. <clears throat> uh... I don't know, uh, Daniel. If you want to clarify positions at all, because I mean, you're you're hanging out with a bunch of anarchists here. We we don't really have this a, a thing. I mean, borders stopping people are freaking stupid. If goods can move across borders, if money can move across borders, then so can people. The only if if you put a if you put a border and stop only the people, then you immiserate a population. It does no one any good. So the, this whole I, distinction between legal versus illegal immigration is just nonsense. My family all just walked into this country. They, they all just walked in because that was normal until 100 years ago. No one was policing borders. And just nobody is illegal on stolen land. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, how do you how do you how do you walk in? seize everything, g-side the people on it, and then say no one else can come. The fuck is that? Yeah. I mean, I was saying as soon as I came in when you just started, like, uh, Prof, have you got any ideas for me because I need to find a new PhD program? And then, you know, I can't believe I'm actually banned from five countries now, including the U.S., I am so angry about that, Nikita. Like, I am, uh, uh, my fury for you being banned to come to your PhD program. Like, I, yeah, I just, I appreciate you so much. And I'm, I, I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. And <laughs> Emily, I don't know if I should, like, just be embarrassed or wear it as a badge of honor. But, uh, <laughs> Like, how do I, how do you get banned from five countries? Like, do I rub people the wrong way that much? Um, hey, at least my partner loves me. Uh, hi. I'd, um, I'd say, yeah, I honestly, I'd, I'd take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm only barred from 
two, and they're both in the Middle East. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'm barred from uh, Israel and Iran. Um, Iran, because I've been, I was interviewing way too many Kurdish people for my research. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. Oh wow! I, I, yeah. Why would, they be, why would they be that nervous about that? Because okay, so during the the protests um, after the hijab incident. Um, oh, it's it, okay. It, there it, were. Yeah. That, there were that, that makes sense to about me. whether it was. There was a lot of uh, rhetoric going around of whether it it was anti Kurdish uh, violence, because Masa um, Amini was Kurdish. So, oh, Kitty, man. She's so tiny, though. Yep. She's a little baby. Little tiny little baby. She's a tiny little baby. Um, orange cat energy, though. She's oh. She's got orange cat energy in her eyes. She's she is a look. She, she, she harasses the other two cats a lot. She is extremely bold. Yeah. Orange cat energy. Mm-hmm. I am convinced. Oh, um, I told uh, my partner yesterday that I am absolutely convinced that black cats are just burnt orange cats. <laughs> Interesting. Um, every black cat I've had has been so mellow. I've never seen anything like them. That's interesting. Every single black cat I have met has been like a little, just a little bit like more chilled than the orange cat. But still, as soon as they, the orange cat energy activates, it's like, yeah, they're orange. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, they've always been so different personality-wise from the oranges I've had. I think two of my, I think, gosh, are they the, they may be my two quietest cats ever were both jet black. Oh, my one was named Lucy Fur, Lucy hyphen Fur. (laughs) (laughs) And she was my baby. I bottle fed her from five weeks old. From less than five weeks old, actually. They estimated that she was about five weeks old. Bottle fed her, raised her. She was my alarm clock sitting on my forehead at 6 a.m. every morning. Yep. Yeah, that's the that's this kitten here. She sleeps next to my head, I think, deliberately. And then... Oh, right somebody's there. asking. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> it's it's full time. Boop. Somebody's asking why banned from Israel because you know it's actually occupied Palestine, and uh, the Zed word. <laughs> yeah, the Zed yeah. word. Yeah, um, look, like I, I, I don't know why. Like I'm one of those people who just laughs at trauma because I'm like, if I don't laugh, I'm gonna cry about it. But I tell people I went to Palestine and I had the most beautiful experiences of my life and met the most humble and honest and kindest people ever. And I was met with such hospitality and I went to Israel and all I got was two broken ribs from the IDF. I yeah, went to Israel. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just walking down random streets, complete strangers are inviting me in for, for coffee. And um, I was um assaulted by settlers um and i've been detained in search a dozen times um before finally being banned outright <clears throat> so yeah. so i was i was detained for three days until the south african embassy mm. yeah i was detained for three days until the south african embassy in ramallah uh, intervened and then i got deported and banned um so yeah that was that was that uh the us because of my Palestinian activism, but also 
my family is just has anti-US sentiment sewn in the fabric of our family. I think our our family tapestry would be like F the US, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, banned from Venezuela because I, I dared uh, write about the um, <laughs> CIA destabilization um, of uh, Venezuela. And that got Venezuela? <laughs> Why wouldn't um, Why wouldn't Maduro like you for that? <laughs> Maduro Maduro didn't. Hmm. It was Maduro's people in London who had banned me. That's fascinating. Because I was I was interviewing. Um, I went to London. Um, I wasn't supposed to partake in any protest action, so I I attended a protest naturally. Um, and then I started interviewing people, even though I was on holiday, I was like, oh, protest, let me see what that's about. And then I decided to, you know, interview people. I met uh, one of the editors of The Guardian and I'm like, hey, I have the story. Can I write it? And he said, cool, cool, cool. And uh, then all of a sudden, bam, no, you're not allowed in Venezuela. Um, em em okay, Emily's like, um, Maduro is a little sketch. Okay, so <clears throat> short yeah. story here. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, one of the one of my commie comrades we used to hang out a lot, and he was, you know, a, a big fan of like uh, the whole Chavistas and everything that you know, like loved Hugo Chavez, thought it was going to turn out great, and I was just like, "There's a lot of um, <clears throat> authoritarian elements here that make me a little bit nervous about this, and I think you should be a lot more." About that. I mean, I, I said that a lot harder than I am now, but, um, and uh, the same thing with Maduro. There's a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of corruption that they used to, to prop things up. There were good things that both of them did for some poor neighborhoods and a lot of deeply corrupt, shady shit. Um, and you can't take the good and not call out the bad. You know, it just, it just it's nonsensical. You, you gotta like, <clears throat> okay, be fair about all of it. So I was, I was critical all along of Chavez and Maduro, and it took him a long time to come back around and say, eh, you know what, you were right about that. <laughs> um, uh, but it doesn't mean that what the U.S. is doing was any better. It doesn't justify anything the U.S. did. I mean, we did a lot of fucked up stuff to them. I mean, that, that's, that's, it, but two things can be fucked up at the same time. <clears throat> thing can be more than one thing. Yeah. Oh, I, I had I had a little bit of a Chevy uh, phase as well, Emily, until I was like, hmm, let me actually look into this. Um, but then the, the last banning order came from India when um, Modi uh, came into power and I started looking into how they're reinstituting the caste system through policing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a series for the Daily Beast on how... Um, the uh, Indian police treat uh, rape cases and how it's it differs between the uh, the Dalits and the mm -hmm. Brahmins and, and the rest of the caste system and how they're kind of enforcing caste distinctions through policing. And I must have written about seven or eight articles on it, like on different aspects of society, starting with that one. And um, when I applied for, I was selected for um, a conference to present at a conference in India. And I went to the um, Indian consulate in Johannesburg and said, Hi, I'd like to apply for my uh, temporary visa. In fact, you know what, can you give me the forms to apply for my um, non resident Indian uh, passport? And they said, No. And they sent me home. And they're like, No, you're not welcome. That one doesn't surprise me, though. <laughs> yeah. That one does not at all. Yeah, the, there's a lot of, um, in the whole great politics and things like that, there is a, a, a bit of the trying to, oh, how do you put that, put people in their place kind of bullshit mm -hmm. that they're still willing to tolerate. Um, you can see that, too, in, in some of the ways that they, they deal with the, the whole, like, um, Oh gosh, I don't know how you say that in, in TikTok. Yeah, the honor, whatever you know, like the those. There, are, there are places where people are just not pursued for those kind of, that that kind of violence. So. But actually, question: 
how does a country come back from that? <laughs> how does a country come back from embracing the far right, you mean? Yeah. Have any ever? I mean, the U.S. is yeah. still in denial, but, you know, there's a reason that, like, um, they sold out Madison Square Garden in the 30s <laughs> for fascists in the U.S. Yeah. That shit never went away. We just lied about it. Um, same thing in, in, in Germany. It never went away either. You know, the, you just, I mean, or, or, or Italy or Austria or anywhere else, you know? I mean, it's never really gone. Um, it can be chased out of politics for a while and made kind of disreputable. And education can definitely help to, to temper it a bit, uh, to weaken some of those um, nationalist bonds there. But I don't know that we've got any good solid cases of it ever truly disappearing anywhere. So I think we're still trying to figure out how to truly come back from, from it, you know? So it, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that. It, questions like that are what got me into studying um identity in the first place you know you know why do people get sucked in? why is it so important why is this how is it how is it these t the, the, the worst possible fucking ideas are very easy to transmit from generation to generation and good ones are not <clears throat> um <clears throat> benny maru would like to know what your take is on the NATO conference and the Russo-Ukraine war? Um, honestly, I pay no attention to anything NATO says about it because it's pretty reflexively dishonest. Uh, it, it's it's sort of akin to listening to Kremlin propaganda. Like, why why bother? So, I I I I, I, don't, I don't I don't trust the rhetoric on on either side of this kind of conflict so I, I paid no attention to it for a while I last paid any real attention to NATO conferences a few years ago it's, it's been a while thank you and, and then um, oh yeah go for it Nikita there's, a, there's, a, there's an old YouTube video of me actually talking about um, a much earlier because um, this um, these Ukraine Russia things been going on for a lot longer than people think um, there was a video I did a number of years ago talking a bit about one of those um, meetings and some of the dishonesty around it, but yeah, gosh, I, I barely remember that. But yeah, I, I don't pay enough attention to it these days. It's um, the, the, the kind of reflexive dishonesty on all, on all sides of it really kind of rankles, and I have enough to kind of frustrate me these days, you know, if, if I paid attention to everything that I've been interested in over the years. I would probably be putting my head through the wall every day. I gotta pick and choose the things that I've got the patience for. Yeah, and it's people ask me not to open. When people ask me, like, why do you care so much about um, Palestine and why do you, why are you not paying attention to to Ukraine? I'm like, I hate to break it to you, but firstly, you have to choose your battles, and secondly, I don't care about white people fighting white people. <laughs> fair <laughs> that's fair yeah i've um i i've spent a lot more time on it over the years just because i i mean i qualified to teach russian history so i mean i i have to pay some attention to all that kind of stuff but i um yeah i have um with when there are so many horrible things happening in the world all at the same time I, I can't keep up with all of them so yeah it's, it's mayo on mayo crime at this point anna you said somebody else had a question uh yeah um hannah wanted to clarify earlier about her point about um racism in europe of not trying to uh, deny that there was racism against black people, but that uh, the racism in Europe against um, Muslims has been increasing and that it's a pretty significant problem. I just wanted to put that uh, clarification in here. Wait, that I, was, I, we were talking about that a long time ago. I, I, uh, I, I, I think I missed something in the clarification. What was clarified? 
Oh, we were talking about racism in Europe and how there isn't racism or uh, how there is racism against black people in Europe. And it's it was the differentiation between European racism and American racism and how um, it's more so in uh, America than Europe against black people specifically. Yeah, but what was the is the clarification oh. that it's about black people? So so then. So what Hannah was saying was that they weren't trying to uh, deny that there was racism in Europe, but that they were specifically highlighting the um, increase in Islamophobia in Europe. I mean, that's that that's fair. I mean, it, it is a it is an issue, but the um, anti-black racism has also been increasing at the same time because of the number of African migrants who've been making their way to Europe. So. There have been a there's been a lot more criticism and attacks and whatnot against you know you know West African uh, migrants and whatnot that have moved up into there. So it they they, they kind of go to Socrates. I put you down twice already. You're in the way. He's staring at me confused. But but I'm cute. I'm cute. Can I just stop here? Ugh. But yeah, the Islamophobia has definitely been growing for a long, long time, but so too has the anti-black racism that's quite frankly always been there. But it was less of a big deal because the black population is historically quite small in most of Europe. Um, and as it has been growing in the last 20 years, so too has the racism. <clears throat> uh, and that's true everywhere. <clears throat> Um, but it's still like proportionally there are fewer people of black African origin in Europe than there are people of Muslim origin in Europe so it's still a smaller problem in some ways so you, you can just like what you, what stands out I think that's a good clarification thank you um, I haven't seen any other questions um how about this fat gray booger then? Little fat gray booger. You know, you know, being a little pain in the butt. So, is Minerva named after Minerva McGonagall? <laughs> um, that kind of depends. Um, when she was first picked up off the street, she was picked up by, um, uh, an ex of mine who did name her after Minerva McGonagall, but I got her almost immediately because uh, it turned out the scale didn't really like having a cat around all the time and was always closing her bedroom door to sleep and um, would like scratch and claw and like tear up the carpet trying to get through the door to get to the human. Um, so she gave her to me. So she immediately became a war goddess. <clears throat> So for me, yep. she's named for a war goddess, and I speak to her in Latin sometimes. But, but she was originally named for a witch. <laughs> a witch who was named after a war goddess, because I mean, if you look at the character of Minerva McGonagall, she's badass. And one of my favorite parts in the movies is Pier Totem Locomotor, <laughs> and her just gleefully saying, "I've always wanted to use that spell." <laughs> yeah, she's a, uh, she's. She's fierce and she's smart, so it definitely fits. So by extension, she's still ultimately named for a Roman war goddess. But, um, but this gal was thinking of, you know, Harry Potter, and I wasn't. Yeah. Welcome, Cactus. Welcome, Cactus. How are you doing the second time? Wait, you already came up, right? Or no? Yeah. Very yeah, early man. on for a second. But how, yeah, how's everybody doing? Really hope. hope everyone's having a good Friday. Hanging in there. Yeah, also, <laughs> yeah um, Shabbat Shalom, Juma Mubarak. All the things. All the things. Um. Yeah. What's the question? If do you have one? <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, I do. I, I actually had two that came to mind, but one was just generally, um, I don't know. I work in a field where generally I just, imposter syndrome is sort of part of the deal. And I've always liked to learn a lot about different things and sometimes haven't had the patience or time to really get as into things as I wanted to before moving on to a different subject. And ideally I'd like to learn a lot about many different subjects. And I know that you're somebody who you know, certainly has done that more than many people, um, you know, have been able to, or, or have desired to. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that kind of feeling of, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I want to learn everything. I want to know everything, but you know, you kind of realize that, you know, less and less, the more you kind of have that, you know, discipline, interdisciplinary passion for learning, I guess. Um, huh. That's that that that's tough because I um I started out with the whole um I will never know enough about anything kind of attitude. So I've never actually tried to be the expert on something and I've never really measured myself against other people or get involved in like competitive kind of shit about that. It's one of the reasons I I hate the whole debate kind of culture anyway, because it's just a pissing contest. Like, I don't, I don't, dude, I don't, I don't want to see your dick. Like put away the ruler. I don't want to see it, but we don't, we don't need to do this. Like it's, I don't care. Um, so I, I never really, I, I don't, I, I don't experience the whole imposter syndrome thing. Um, either. Uh, it's just, I'm an intellectual nomad. I bounce from subject to subject. Um, the only reason I seem like I know a bunch of stuff is because I have a pretty decent memory, but I bounce from subject to subject kind of randomly. I'm always like looking at different things. I mean, everything is interesting to me, but, but that's, that's it. At the end of the day, everything is interesting or at least not everything, but a, a range of things. So, okay. So math sucks. I'm going to leave that all to like the Emily's of the world. <laughs> like I'm not my thing. Like y'all can have your numbers, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but, um, most things are interesting <laughs> and I, um, but I, I always go at it thinking, you know, I'm never going to be able to know everything about this thing. And that that's a nonsensical idea anyway. Why would I want to try to do that? Why would I want to, to think that I'm like the expert? As soon as you think that you know everything, you stop learning. So what the fuck is the point? Like, I, I want to like keep thinking of myself as ignorant as fuck so that I keep reading. <laughs> so. Nikita? Yeah, so, I, I think... Okay, go ahead. To answer your uh, question a little bit, I, I hope I can. So when I was a journalist, a full-time journalist, I had the privilege of interviewing Sir David Attenborough. Um, for all of the, the fans, please let that sink in. Yes, I interviewed Sir David Attenborough. We're not worried. He was fantastic. He was incredible. And... Um, I got a whole lot of people to on social media to say, you know, um, send me your best questions for Sir David. And when I spoke to him, one of the questions that was sent to me was, do you know everything? And his answer was beautiful. He said, the fact that he will never know everything is a comfort because that means that there's always more to learn. And when there's always more to learn, it means that you keep your soul invigorated. This is why I, I like him so much. He has, you can speak if you look at him and dude is like older than dirt now, but if you look at his eyes, you can see the childlike wonder, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's the same uh, impression I got from a, a lot of people like, uh, like Sagan or whatever too. Like they, they still like, you can see the curiosity in their face. Like everything is just, it's always new. And that's just that's me with philosophy and history you know it's it's like it's always new and interesting because i refuse to think that i've ever actually mastered anything you know I, i'm i'm fine with yeah. that level of ignorance you know and i think as long as you approach things convinced of your own ignorance as a good thing then you can't feel like you're an imposter because what are you what would i i'm not trying to be an expert in the first place 
Oh, Emily is you so know, curious. I, I would you. say I, I sort of... <laughs> I would say I sort of have the same attitude. I mean, I really don't have a problem with imposter syndrome, honestly. I, I probably should have phrased it better, but more just the frustration because, uh, you know, and there's also a certain worry about mortality. You know, it's not just about being an expert and saying you know all this, but just to be able to get to know it. You know, there's almost kind of panicked um, or you know, unsettling feeling sometimes that you can get, you know what I mean? Well, learning should be unsettling to begin with, so I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> exactly what you mean there. And, and like for mortality, too, I mean, honestly, I hope I'm still doing this stuff when I'm at Ambrose age, you know? I, mean, I, I, I hope that I can still have that same childlike sense of wonder and curiosity about everything. Yeah. I think the only it's thing like, that's ever about yeah, yeah, I'm I mean, this is more a matter of just... Um, Coming from, uh, coming with, with, with my background coming into this kind of thing, I struggled to take myself at all seriously. So it stopped me for a long time from wanting to write because oh, who want to listen to me anyway? I'm just a fucking longshoreman. I mean, what, what the fuck do I know, you know? Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious about this stuff, but I'm just like, whatever my little amateur shit, I'm going to think about my stuff and talk to my friends and that's fine. I'm, I'm done with, I, I couldn't get myself to want to, to publish out there and now it's more a matter of you know the um the difficulty of going back to do a doctorate later in life and then you know supporting a household by yourself and everything else i mean i just i don't have the the time to do the research that i want to do because for me i'm i'm too fussy about what i do right i want to be comfortable with it and that's that's difficult. That requires a lot more mental energy for me to sort through the problems. And, and once when I when I'm cool with an idea, cool, I, stuff, stuff flies out. But I got I got to mull it over. I got to think about it. And when I come home at the end of the day, I have to have time and emotional energy to think through it and want to do that. And I struggle to do that. So for financial reasons, I still struggle a bit. So the only thing that gets me in this kind of question area is I would like to be able to leave behind something interesting that. People so that some other some other crazy nerd, you know, 50 years from now might find stimulating, you know, just find in the, in the, in the uh, randomly in a library shelf like, oh, this this seems like a weird idea. I've never thought about that and like pick up my book and read it. And I would want to like inspire curiosity in other people, which, quite frankly, is one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm fine with doing things like this, you know, is because I'm trying to inspire people to give a shit about the world and be curious. It's, it's the same kind of basic passion. But I would like to be able to write more that I can put in a damn library to leave something behind. That's the only way in which my mortality ever bothers me. I, I'd be perfectly comfortable, like, my whole life, you know, to keep learning, never really thinking I'm, I, I know enough about anything. You know what that reminds me of, Prof? Uh, you know, um, the line from Catch-22, he had decided to live forever or die in the attempt. <laughs> that's exactly it leave something behind that immortalizes you yeah you know yeah. it's all we've really got you know i mean i would like to live another five thousand years and keep seeing all the cool stuff that's happening in the world but it's not going to happen so you know if i can leave something else behind that I mean, inspires somebody else that passes on some little of the shit that i figured out you know there's there's a lot of things that that I, that I think and say that i i've never bothered to write down at any point in my life and i think it would be it would be nice at some point if I could kind of get over the, I guess the, the only place I, 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 I guess I do have a little bit of that imposter syndrome type stuff is this sense that I, I really have struggled to, to think about, I struggle with, with um, feeling like I should write things down for a lot of my life. And by the time I got to the point where I was very comfortable with that and have been for a while, at this point, in the last 15 years, I've worked so many hours that I, but if I get home, I want to just relax. You know, I mean, the only reason I can do this is because honestly, this is relaxing. But I, but if I get back from like, I, I drive more than 32,000 miles a year. Um, but if I get home from those commutes, I don't want to do a damn thing but get high and watch cartoons. Do you yeah, listen to it? Sit down and go through like, do, do comb through files and start writing shit. Yeah, that's very real. Uh, but but do you listen to audiobooks while driving? At all? I do. Oh yeah, yeah. Same. But yeah, I, th I think that kind I, of captures. 
or I'm sorry. I can't uh, podcasts. Um, podcasts are too slow. Like, it, it, like the, just the back and forth. You need to listen work. to my podcast, Prof. You need to subscribe to my podcast. <laughs> yeah, send me a link. I'll find it. I'll try I'll it. But the link. I, I tried with with some of them. I um, had an excellent to them, and I, I listened to a few, but I I struggle to to keep the attention on it. You know, because when they start bantering back and forth and you know, joking and talking about things, like oh God, my mind wanders off to something else. Now, audiobooks are hard enough. I I because I don't I don't learn as well orally. I have a hard time. I, I, language processing is is always been a little difficult for me, so it takes more concentrations. So like audiobooks in the car, I am constantly backing up and listening to the same section again. Where if you give me a book, I'm going to read a thousand to sixteen hundred words a minute and have perfect retention. Um, but uh, to listen to an audiobook, I'm constantly hitting the the back thirty seconds, back thirty seconds, going over because my mind wanders off for a second and then i have no idea what the fuck just happened <laughs> i completely missed it yeah to answer uh, hannah's question uh, yes i do have a podcast it's called the bipolar feminist it's on patreon it's how it's my income it's my only income uh, at the moment and uh it's between five and 35 dollars a month please don't sign up for the free version because you're not getting anything on patreon i don't know why patreon included the free version um but yeah um, f between five and thirty-five dollars a month, depending on what you want to get. So yeah, it includes podcast readings, a whole lot of sh other stuff. It's just about, you know, feminist education, about mental health, exactly what the name says. But now it's about Palestine. Um, but yeah, it's on Patreon. I'll s I'll send you the link, Prof. But as yeah, somebody said in the comments, I'm sure, I'm sure I, I want to have on my. T I want to see. Uh, I, I want on my tombstone. I told you so. I always wanted. If I ever got buried, I I, uh, I wanted, um, she laid down that boogie and played that funky music till she died. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that one, Prof. Yeah, that was good. But yeah. I, d I decided that I want to be cremated and I want my ashes to be put into little hourglasses so I can still dominate at family game nights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, people stop playing a lot of game types with me, <laughs> which is because I'm not competitive. I don't, I don't want to win. Like I don't care at all. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I want to have fun. You know. So we're always like, yeah. pick a game that everyone else is so good at and I'm terrible at. Please, like. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm like, I was officially banned from Trivial Pursuit like decades ago. Like no, no one will touch it. Yeah. With me. <clears throat> Yeah, same. But uh, as to you know, the the whole leaving oh, behind is like, when I was six a, years old. The the epitaph thing, right? Okay, so um, my uh, what I want on a on a tombstone is um, uh, non fui fui uh, non sum uh, non curo. <laughs> it's super pithy. It's just a handful of words, you know. Uh, I I was not. I was, I am not, I don't care. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's like, okay, I, I wasn't here and then I was here and now I'm gone again and okay, so what? <laughs> like it's, but, it, but it looks kind of like uh, sophisticated, but it's like super, super short. It's like, you know, like, it's like six or it's like seven words and then all like three letter words. So, <laughs> but um, I had, um, I was having a conversation with my, my partner and we have really like we, we live 13,000 kilometers apart and like one of our naughtier conversations he's like describe what our meeting will be like and I'm like Veni, Vidi, Veni. It took him a second and he's like oh god. Wait, wait. What was that again? Veni, Vidi, Veni. <laughs> You, can, you know, Veni, Veni, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. Yeah, but is it, are, you, are you saying the last one twice? Veni. Sorry, sorry. Veni, Veni. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was mishearing the second line twice. Like, no, that ain't right. 
<laughs> Emily gets it. Um, <laughs> That's cute. But also, when I was when I was about six years old, um, well, in first grade, um, you know, the teacher asks, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And you know, everybody's like, you know, firefighter and teacher and and whatnot. And I was like, I want to be happy. And she, she was like, you know, okay, that's not a job. Like, okay, I want to know everything. Like, also, that's not a job. And then I said, okay, I want to be a tourist. <laughs> she gave up at that point. It's, it's, it's such you, a, you know, the, the that's just kind of propaganda right there. You know, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, I want to be happy human, like person. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we define? Why, why do we define ourselves by what we do to make other people money? You know the uh, the movie Office Space, where yeah, where, I, where I, they ask you know oh if you had a million dollars you know what would you and you just say yeah, yeah I would do nothing. <laughs> I would do nothing. <laughs> but but yeah, that is the point. Like we were talking about AI because um, one of our, our people on on one of the servers has a subscription to a whole lot of AI tools. And they were writing these really bad short stories, like prompting AI to write these really bad short stories. And it was hilarious. But like, we need AI to automate things for us so that we can go out and do more things like be creative. Because what do you do? What do people who have the freedom that money gives them, what do they do? They go into the arts, they go into music, they go into creativity. Yeah. <laughs> they write they do things that, <laughs> that fuels their soul. Mm -hmm. Like somebody wanted to literally climb Kilimanjaro. And so, you know, I have the finances to do it. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So whatever that, whatever fuels your soul, that is what the freedom of money will give you. Because I don't like money. As soon as money comes into my bank account, I just, I just want to let it go. I think I'm allergic to it. <laughs> and if I had, I, I, I don't want money. I want the freedom that money will give in this current society. And boys and girls, remember, the only ethical consumption under capitalism is eating ass. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, there's a, a good question um, from uh, from Mercy. Um, could AI take down capitalism? So I'll give you like a really short historical question. automation and capitalism. Because no, <laughs> the, the if you actually look at the economic logic behind this, the, the way automation works, right? Um, People were saying this in the 18th century, they said it in the 19th century, saying well into the 20th century, that the more we automate things, the less people will need to work. So we'll transition toward a leisure society, and people will end up making their money by taking holidays and let's go climb Kilimanjaro and shit like that because we won't all have to work 50 hours a day down mill. But what does capitalism do? It makes up new busy work in order to keep all the profit from the automation at the top. So capitalism is the problem. Automation is not the problem. AI is not the problem. Capitalism is. Why do you think AI is being used to take over tons of white collar jobs? You know, like actuaries are going to disappear. Accountants are going to disappear. There's going to be no purpose for them anymore. The computers will do all that shit. You know, it's bad enough that they're now trying to like get into art with them. So now we don't have to hire like starving artists to do our graphic design for ads. The advertising can be created entirely by computers and the executives just make all the money. It just fucks everybody else, right? The whole point of automation should be so that we have more freaking time. Capitalism cannot give us that. So AI won't fix anything any more than steam-powered factoring machines would fix things. Because the actual owner class is always just going to find new shitty ways to exploit us. And they're going to say, oh, well, gosh, I've got these machines now, so you're just going to take less money. Why do you think wages have been falling across a lot of the developed world? The only places they haven't been falling is places with really strong unions that won't put up with that shit. 
in the U.S., wages today are lower than they were in the 1970s if you adjust for inflation because they don't need us and they want to keep all the profit at the top. But what they should have been doing with that in a sensible economy would be we're now working 20-hour weeks and making more than we used to make, not less. That's what AI and, and automation should have been doing for it, but it's not. And and as much as I think that in the short run, something like um, uh, a universal basic income is essential, it's only a stepping stone away from that because ultimately it's a right-wing idea that sustains the basic capitalist architecture. It's just to trying to stop some of the bleeding because people are freaking starving. You know, we need to move away from this entire economic model. Yeah, and we need to get to where, I don't know, I want my luxury gay space communism where the machines do all the work and we get to like sit back and like, you know, smoke weed and watch cartoons. <laughs> like, the, the, you know, at the end of the day, that's the whole point. Why, why are we inventing these computers and machines to do this stuff in the first place? Because a capitalist economy is completely unsustainable this way. You know, it needs us to spend money. If we're not making money, we can't spend the fucking money. So the whole thing is just a giant circle jerk at this point. All it can do is survive based upon our exploitation, which is why, especially in the U.S., but also in, in Canada, the U.K., tons of other places, work hours are going up instead of down. And a lot of it is completely wasted. Office workers in particular are productive for like two hours a day. You walk in, you're productive for a little while, and you spend most of your time posting on social media, talking to your friends, hanging out in the break room. It's just bullshit. But they want us to work all these extra hours so they can keep the wages low. It's a scam to create a permanent underclass. So, no, AI is not going to fix a damn thing. It's just going to keep making things worse as long as the economic system is not changed. Can I also say something? Uh, because I just read a paper about this yesterday, um, and and I, I work in uh, computer science. And AI in general might plateau, and I, it indeed probably already has, because there just isn't enough data to actually improve them. So a lot of you know big tech marketing is going into this. You know, oh, it's just going to get exponentially better, and AI is going to be smarter than us in five years. You know, because we've had a pretty rapid increase in the capabilities of the technology. But um, and I can send the paper to anyone who's interested. But there, there's a growing amount of academic research that indicates that it's probably going to reach a bottleneck pretty soon. And and also the amount of energy it uses is unbelievable, and it, it's horrible for the climate. It's the equivalent of talking. You know, one request is the equivalent of talking on the phone for two hours in terms of the amount of energy it consumes. So, um, yeah, I'm 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 very you know, cynical towards uh, you know post scarcity AI future of capital, you know, end of capitalism kind of things. Again, if we can change the the underlying energy infrastructure and the, and the profit driven uh, economics, then why not? You know, if if you're not needing to make a bunch of money off of it, then the AI can be developed. You know, I mean, it's not like the Soviets made any damn money inventing space stations. You know, it's it's you're driving science. You know, you, we can do this stuff, but we also have to fix the energy infrastructure for sure. This is one of the reasons that crypto is, uh, offends me so much because it costs so much electricity and it's even more well the, the wealth is even more concentrated at the top than with regular currency so what the hell's the point you know ai i think one of the things that helps to drive a lot of it right now is is um the really weak legislation protecting um privacy rights and just how much of our data is actually controlled already and the more that we get used to living online the more that we're producing all the time all of our email is scanned Everything that we type into search uh, search engines is scanned. Everything is collected. All that stuff is feeding into these things. And the more that you can release the AIs to study all of that data, the better they can get. But there's massive privacy violations in doing that. So I, I don't think that there's as big a technical barrier on it, but just because of all that, because we're going to keep coming up with new stuff to feed it all the time. But will the developments be as fast? Because I, I've seen a paper just like this one too, you know, a, a, about it plateauing actually just this week. Um, the, the, the rate at which they've been, you know, increasing is probably not going to maintain, it, be, be maintained for a while because, yeah, you're, they jumped up ahead in terms of what they can do, 
but at this point you have to keep adding stuff into it, keep adding sophistication. And a lot of the a lot of it's still limited because a lot of the current AI stuff is more software driven than anything else. It's not really the, the computers aren't aren't I mean our really big supercomputers are about as smart as a bumblebee. They're really not that sophisticated in terms of their own processing power. It's they're at the end of the day, they're not that far removed from like <laughs> you know the, the difference engine kind of like nineteenth century computers. It's still like moving things around, calculating, but it's not really thinking. It's not really creative. AI cannot be creative at this point, and that's more of a hardware limitation. So where we're going to plateau here is in terms of like the very rapid increase in in in, uh, in sophistication what they can do. But you have to crack a few hardware nuts for it to take the next leap forward. So it it, it it'll be a while before we we're, we're not we're not we're not like Skynet's not around the corner. <laughs> yeah, and the and the data is a huge bottleneck. Oh, sorry, sir. It's, it's no, really, go ahead. Just yeah. want to kind of say good night. To that too. You know, the more countries try to put in law, a lot of European countries in the EU are trying to pass better privacy restrictions. I mean, honestly, the Israelis get a lot of shit about their, their genetic laws, but honestly, that's part of the reason for that. Was one of, the, one of the rationales for it was to keep some of that data from being public and then mined by tons of medical companies and whatnot. Because the, my genetic test, my, my DNA test that I did, they own that data. They own my genetics. I, it was worth it to me because I wanted to know the stuff. I wanted to see about the 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 what, am I am I prone to certain hereditary diseases or whatever. But they have a right to profit indefinitely on my fucking genome. Like, there's a lot of really big data problems we've got to deal with in this country in particular that a lot of other countries are a little bit better at, but still, it's problematic around the world. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go. It is past 3 a.m. Good yeah. night, everybody. Thank you so much for the uh, for the talk, Professor. And um, remember, um, smash the motherfucking patriarchy, eat all the white men, uh, listen to Hosea and free Palestine. Oh! We gotta figure out where, where, you, where you can go though. Like, okay, so where you're not banned from. We, I, I don't know, like, yes. to somebody. We gotta find some place we can okay. send you off to, you know? Uh, yeah, I do have a um, a residence permit for Sweden. That means I, that I, I have. I, 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 have I, a I know some people. Of... I know people at Lund University. I, I, in fact, I, I know two of the directors at their Middle East Institute at, at Lund. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. I, the only thing is that I need to find full funding. I cannot pay, I can't pay for a PhD because it's just way out of my financial means. I haven't yeah. had full-time work for the past seven right. years. I know there are scholarships. I don't know how competitive or how that works, but I could I could put you in touch with the right kind of people that you could ask and see if, if it's possible. Yes. And see if you... you, you hit it off with them, whatever, like they'll be impressed by you. In fact, yeah, in fact, they're, they're people who care a lot about, I mean, the, that book on the, um, parallel states idea for, uh, for Palestine, Israel was at a Lund university. Um, uh, Ooh, so wow. they're, they're, they're Palestine, they're pro Palestine people already. So they're not going to look askance at all. So yeah, like let, let's, talk, let's talk about Sweden. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm probably going to try to, I'm going to try to fundraise to go to Sweden um, by January um, because, you know, the situation at my home, it's not very safe for me, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I escaped once, I had to come back because of, a, because of money, um, but it's still unsafe, so I'm going to have to uh, start the fundraising to actually get there properly soon. Because I well, want to be there. Give me a Discord when you're awake. Let's let's talk about it. I'll, I'll I'll find some context. I'll get you talking to like Matthias and Mark. You know, we'll see if we can figure anything out. Yeah, Ahana, uh, it's um in journalism, it's um the actual topic itself. It's looking at representation of schmectual violence in um, mainstream media or mainstream journalism. Alrighty. Well, good night. I'm going to try and sleep. And if I cannot sleep, then I will be back in the comments. <laughs> sleep. It's, right. it's, 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 it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I keep on joking and saying that I don't sleep because white supremacy doesn't sleep, but that's not going to fly for much longer. <laughs> no, it, um, it starts to have some negative health 
Eben. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, honestly, my, my weird sleep schedule is one of the reasons I, I, I gained some weight in the first place. You know, I mean, when I when I had a more sane work schedule and was more physically out there, you know, but sitting around all the time on the computer reading, you know, staying up at all weird hours, and the next thing you know, you're eating at two a.m. Not good for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. All the love. Good night, Nikita. All right. I'm gonna take this brief intermission to plug a brief intermission. Um, Everyone, go stand up, uh, stretch your legs, drink water, eat, tap, and delight the live. You can donate hot peppers if you would like. Uh, we have a big goal, or we're ambitious goal of 100. I think you could set lower goals, by the way. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I picked that one because it's like the one. It, it's, it only costs one, so it's, mm. yeah, but yeah. I, I, I honestly I do not understand how any of this crap works and I don't care if I meet a goal or don't meet a goal or anything it's never really it, it feel like it makes no sense to me anyway so I might as well see if I can get a bunch of peppers I'm gonna go get some water <laughs> perfect I love it oh, that's a nice job guys Yeah, so it does boost the live in some way. Uh, I can't tell you how, but it gets you out there. So go Hot Peppers. Go, Anna. <laughs> How's the Rona treating you? Ugh. I'm on the other side, finally, but it has been a long time coming. You, you haven't uh, had it before, Anna? No, this is my third time. Thanks. The other time it reactivated my mono, so that was fun. Oh, so then I was sick for like two months. I had it when it first this... was the United States because I was traveling. Oof. I avoided it for a long time, and then they removed the masking ban here and i was a caregiver at the time and my client rode public transit and he likes to uh suck on his mask and then i got it twice um so that tells you how well the, ma the masks worked before that i still mask in like indoor spaces I work with children, so I'm at a point right now where even if I'm masked, I don't know how well I could avoid it because, yes, I take NAC. NAC will help. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, the children touch me. On my, they, they like to um, hold my hands a lot, and I have eczema, so I can't use hand sanitizer. Oh. The weed germ airport. Factory. Yeah. Oh. I'm about to go steal some snacks downstairs. Finally. These I thought you already did. No, I'm going down there. Um, there's some kind of party thing. It's outside. <laughs> with snacks and I don't need to know anything else. I just need to yeah. There was like the entire household in the kitchen. There was like four people in the kitchen. So I need to go back to make food. Right now you do? At some point. If they okay. left. I'm avoiding the people. Um I'm not gonna you be go like first, a I'm not going to be a functional mod for the time being, and I don't have a question. I just came up to whatever to like wreak chaos. Well, we don't have anyone requesting, so. Okay. 
Um, I'm gonna mute and go down there real quick. Yeah, you go first, I'll wait. Emily's braving um, a party to get snacks. That's scary. <laughs> Parties, that is. Hmm. I'll be honest, I don't think that there is a conspiracy that a new virus will be let out before the U.S. election. I mean, I agree that the conspiracy probably exists. However, um, I think that's pretty well correlated. The cause of COVID wasn't man-made, if I'm correct. Was not? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, there's still very little that can possibly tie it to any kind of um, human intervention, but, the, but enough that the conspiracy theorists are still running with it. But the, the overall consensus is no, that it's not. Uh, the, I just noticed something, uh, in another couple of years, I won't be able to see any of these things. Like t-shirts don't work well with beards. Uh, the noon has already like disappeared. You, you can't see it at all <laughs> in this. Uh, I didn't even tell it was Arabic. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. anyway, it's backwards, but can anybody read? Oh, I show um, Let's, uh, do this. Um, um I'm sure some people know what this is. <laughs> Bernie. Yeah, it's uh, starting to disappear already. You need twin Nothing. braids. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I started braiding it at about this point or, or before um, originally. Um, so this is uh, this is quite a while for me to let it just keep going. Um, I don't know why I haven't started braiding it again. Laziness, maybe. But I, I'll put it back into three braids eventually. But until then, my t-shirts are all going to start disappearing and no one's going to read anything. <laughs> Do you think you could uh, make um, me use Corduroy, give them live access? Or a uh, super mod, whatever. The oh, manager. so the, I mean, up and down and all that stuff. Uh, that isn't a default for that one? I thought I did that already. Um, and I Because I, I knew who that was and thought I had done it. Um, oh, I guess I did not. I just did the basic one. Hold on. Uh, there it is. Oh, that's really small. <clears throat> I forgot the last couple of weeks. This is now three weeks in a row. I didn't do the, um, lies with the other computer going as well so it's all automatically on YouTube so it's only a TikTok and then I forgot to actually <clears throat> um, edit and upload the last two so they're uploading right now so that was the one of the disadvantages of doing that entirely through TikTok was always having to do this separately once you started doing it through YouTube I it was much easier to watch on YouTube it was much easier to what on YouTube it was much easier to watch on YouTube, like when you go back and watch it. Oh, I'm I'm sure, like it gets like the really skinny screen on a you know on, on a lot of things just doesn't work well. Um, and the the sound I think is better too because on on the YouTube it's it's got my Yeti mic and here it's just a little telephone recording it. Yeah, I was going to, yeah, to do it. I was going to do it tonight. Is I was going to get back to that. Um, but um, the um, the other upload was taking freaking forever because it was one of those like eight hour marathon ones. So it hope it overlapped with this so I couldn't. But next week. <laughs> yeah, the audio would pick up the mics of the people on the panel and then it would cut into what you were saying. So you couldn't like it would just I don't um every time it did it like someone would sigh or be like uh huh uh huh and then your audio would cut out every time they did that. Oh interesting. I wonder why. It does wait. It does for for the the TikTok does that or the YouTube version does that. TikTok. Oh, the TikTok recording is okay. That probably makes more sense. So, I would have thought the the way the mic is set that it would pick up everything perfectly because it's 
I have it aimed such that it picks up the phone and me at the same time. It's like an automatic thing, so if I talk over you, I can't fully hear what you're saying. Hmm. It lowers your volume. Funky. Yeah, it's interesting. I have so little experience actually participating in these things. Oh, I got a, a chili from uh, from uh, Dong there. Um, I think said it, it, they said earlier um, uh, that when people get to bantering here, that it gets kind of boring. Like, yeah, but I don't have to listen to myself. <laughs> so, like, I, don't, I don't experience that. But I, but yeah, other people do. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, we really, whenever there's audio issues, anything like that, please let me know. I can find ways to correct things, but I I don't listen to these things. I don't know what they sound like. I, I have very little experience of that. Um, most of my experience of YouTube and podcasting and whatnot is all doing content, not actually consuming the content. Yeah, at some point I had to go back and catch up, and I think at that point you were doing like nine, ten hour lives. What is wrong with me? It took a long time to catch up. Like, seriously, just like smack me or something. That's just crazy. After a while, I was like, okay, I got it. I understood what was. <laughs> I came back and. <laughs> oh, stretch. You know what? Okay, well, I haven't seen any questions coming up, so if you guys do have any. Um, Something that I was thinking would be a good topic and something I've seen uh, really present in uh, the Zionist colonial movement is this idea of paternalism around, I don't, and I don't even know if this is the right word of paternalism, but uh, of this idea of like, the Palestinians can't care for themselves, therefore we have to... Uh, uh, over police them and tell them what to do because they're incapable uh mm -hmm. and i think it really tied into a lot of what nikita was talking about and maybe it would be a good topic to talk about well i mean, I mean yeah if anybody doesn't know that kind of orientalist way of thinking has been part of this conflict from the very beginning um the the earliest settlers showing up there, and I mean, I mean, even the ones who were completely freaking clueless and didn't know how to grow food in the area and were going to starve, they still tended to look at the Palestinians as a backward people. Um, there's that very much European racist discourse, it's part of that. And the Israelis very much inherit that. Um, from all that imperial framework, they do look at everyone in the countries around them as somehow distinctly inferior. And you get a lot of the same crap that you get in the U.S. You know, the whole, the Arab mind kind of attitude. Oh, well, they, they need dictators and strong leaders because otherwise it'll be a bunch of like, you know, Islamist theists or whatever, like blowing stuff up because they're all just terrible. Uh, and people say this with a completely straight face. It's... It's the same kind of crap you get from a lot of American think tanks, honestly. It's the same kind of extraordinarily racist discourses. And they're leaving out the fact that so much of the, the corruption, the violence, the incompetence are direct consequences of fucking colonialism. I mean, it's the same situation you've got all across the rest of the Arab world, where tons of countries were literally colonized and had tons of assets seized and tons of people unalived and all kinds of horrifying shit for decades or in some cases well over a century. And then once they're finally free, they're freed by the Europeans turning over power to genuinely awful people, um, either through a peaceful process of choosing the, the kind of dictators you can put there or... Um, people ended up fighting for freedom, and the process of fighting was so violent and destabilizing that, that by the end of it, yeah, you're going to get that kind of like corrupt, you know, incompetence. You know, that's a lot of the situation you got in, in Algeria, for example. But in a lot of it, it's very deliberate um, and engineered to create more incompetent governments because that, of course, allows you to keep saying, see, look, they can't manage their own affairs, therefore, we need to keep pushing them around. It's it's um, it's like a self-fulfilling 
kind of thing, uh, as a sort of self-fulfilling ideological framework. You create terrible conditions that justify the terrible rhetoric that you used to create the terrible conditions in the first place. It's this giant ideological circle jerk in a way. Just work. So what am, I, what am I thinking of? Like feedback loop, you know, like just, you know, spinning around. It's, but yeah, there's a ton of that in Israel. And honestly, the, the Orientalist perspectives um, are a huge part of the basic ideological structure of the state, um, not just of Zionism itself. So they're going to use racist discourses about Palestinian weakness to justify over-policing them, which causes them to react violently and disobediently because they're being over-policed, and then you use that violence or disobedience to justify the over-policing that you were originally justifying just with the ideas. So it, you see, it just keeps feeding around the same way. There's, there's no way out of that cycle once you're on it. As long as somebody believes the bullshit on any level, you can find a way to make it real. And that's one of the reasons it's so difficult to defeat, because whenever I tell people, oh, look, no, they're, Palestinians aren't bad. They're just an oppressed people, blah, blah, blah. They're like, well, why do they blow up a bus then? Oh, you know, rational people don't blow up buses. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, but if you are in any way sympathetic to the racist discourse in the first place, then you can create that sort of self-fulfilling cycle in your own head that you can that you can justify forever, like it'll never change. So the, the trick ultimately is going to be defeating the belief system, and it's difficult to defeat the belief system as long as people can point to examples that seem to support the belief system, which is, it's it's sad, it's fucked up, I, I, I detest it. It's one of the reasons that um, while I understand the strategic logic of, of violence in um, uh, in uprisings, it also it, we have to understand that it also does have a negative side to it. You know, it makes sense; it's it's understandable in its way, but people use it literally to feed these ideological frameworks that justify the architecture of oppression that led to the violence in the first place. So, how can you ever break out of it? It's hard to like convince ordinary people to let go of that because most people are never going to pay enough attention to really understand anything that's going on they're they're just going to dance on the surface and if you're only on the surface level then the arguments sound convincing from a lot of people you know they can they can spin these things into a way that feeds that same racist framework i i don't know a good way off that you know crazy merry-go-round where it, it's i don't know it, it just kind of fucks you in a way I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? But that's it. Just it, it it traps you. It traps you in a cycle where your resistance is completely justifiable and understandable, but your resistance is used to feed the ideology that justified your oppression in the first place. And so the oppression goes on and on and on and on forever. Yeah, I think I'm, I mean, something that I make no secret of is that I was a Zionist for a good amount of time, and uh, it took me a while to be exposed to the extremist beliefs, um, because they have a lot of moderates that do a good job of, like, protecting the really, really racist ones, and that I feel like the moderates are able to reach a base of people who have an understanding of critical race theory, but then, um, they act as almost like a shield between them and then the people who are spouting all of the really, really horrible stuff that are on TikTok. Um, yeah, that's the thing. They, there's a lot of there's a lot of rhetorical sophistication in in what the Zionists do, and it's one of the reasons that I, I warn people. You know, and that doesn't take any kind of conspiracy. It just takes people who are well aware of what they're doing. You know, I mean, if they they are they're playing a game that is quite old by this point i mean the basic justifications for empire and race have been around for centuries and 
the arguments are well honed and people know how to make them work in a way that even people who don't think they are racist can accept them and can swallow a racism. A lot of, a lot of really racist people are convinced that they're not racist because so much of it is so carefully disguised and, and that's very deliberate. And anything that, that feeds into that, that can provide any kind of justification for people, it makes it that much harder to break through the racism, especially since most people who are following the, for this shit really don't think that they're racist. So the, the criticisms are, are hard to make. They, they just don't get it. It's like a kind of willful cluelessness, you know, and everything about our socio-political structure is designed to sustain that because you don't want people informed and thinking critically because they're harder to control. So we we go well out of our way to make this stuff easier for them. You know, the, there's a lot of like weird conspiracies that float around about the, the US's relationship to, to Zionism. And I, I honestly, it it offends me on so many levels that people fall back on the, well, it's Jewish money and this and that because not only is it factually inaccurate and recycling old racist tropes, but it's it's self-defeating in some spectacularly bad ways that actually harm Palestinians. When the truth is actually that we simply share a lot of cultural and political affinities as a racist settler colony. The way that we have had to justify control over black bodies, control over Latin bodies, control over Native Americans in this country is very similar to what the Israelis have had to do to justify their control over the Palestinians. So that, that ideological similarity means that their arguments work for Americans on a very deep level, a very unconscious level um, that I don't think people appreciate enough. You can't just show pictures of like, bodies blown apart of, of, of unalived kids or something and expect most Americans to suddenly like change their view on this. It won't make sense to them that, that there's no capacity to process this stuff because it's so much a part of our own cultural fabric. This uh, this kind of reflexive racism and paternalism. You, you, were, you, you were kind of right to use that, that sort of word. That idea that that you know, brown people can't run their own affairs or something, and they need you know um, colonial control, imperial control, or just a strong dictator or something. Look at how many fucking Americans are going around saying, "Well, so do you miss Gaddafi yet? You know, you bet, I bet you shouldn't have toppled Gaddafi. Everything was great under Gaddafi. Like, never mind. Forty years worth of terrible dictatorship that harmed a lot of a lot of people. Like, but you know, they look at Islamist violence in the country as somehow a justification of tyranny. I'm like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of fucked up shit happening in Libya right now, but they actually have more of an opportunity to create their own society than they've ever had before. You know, at, at any point, whether they were part of empires, colonial control, or under a dictatorship, they actually have some ability to put something together. And that's gonna be messy, but it was messy everywhere else too. It was messy in the US. I mean, how many frickin' You know, civil wars have there been all around the, you know, the, the, the so-called developed world, but we're, we can't have them anywhere else. We have to, like, look down on people. And we look down on them because the idea of a dictatorship there is useful to us because it, it was it, it fits in so many frameworks. It makes it easier for us economically because we can get the resources out without a, a lot of problems. It, it fits a, us ideologically because of the whole the way the war on terror is used to control Americans. You know, we if we as long as we've got an enemy there, you can use it to justify the police state here, you justify military interventions and, and defense spending and everything else. There's so many boxes it ticks off that there's no way you're gonna get people away from that kind of racism. It's just a deep part of the overall cultural fabric. So the media is not gonna do it, the schools aren't gonna do it, the politicians aren't gonna do this shit, we have to do it. We have to unfuck ourselves. And if enough of us unfuck ourselves, then eventually their propaganda doesn't work anymore. This is why um, an informed and critical um, electorate is a real problem for any country and why they kind of go out of their way to discourage it in many ways. But we, we have to do it ourselves and it's difficult to do because it is so well ingrained, but the Israelis absolutely are the beneficiary of two centuries of that kind of discourse.
So they're, they're treating the Palestinians exactly the same way tons of other colonial subjects have been treated. Hi. Yeah, if I hadn't had a lot of like post-colonial education um, in college and through the programs I was in, it would have been much harder to dig myself out of the hole that I got buried in. Because um, as soon as I started hearing them use these paternalistic arguments where they need to like hold the hands of the violent child while he rebels against a mother who just wants to hug him <laughs> right like we mm -hmm. tried so hard but you we know just i just couldn't you. parent you if right you, if you just behave i wouldn't have to beat you i just want to love you <laughs> like no like, yeah um, exactly I, I, um i remember uh, a, a bad um uh like commercial from the 80s like bad in the sense of like it's like traumatizing in a way but like uh it's one of those like anti-child abuse kind of commercials they had and it's it's like you know this smoking mother and it's like if you hadn't made me mad i wouldn't have burned you like this is somebody putting their cigarettes out on their kid you know uh and it's like the way that people justify that though because the person doing that abuse they think that they love their child but they're being terrible you know that's just a lot of people really have a hard time understanding what they're doing is really wrong. A lot of the people who are most justifying these kind of ideals, they honestly think they're the good guys. And, and the fact that they truly believe they're the good guys makes it harder for people to argue against it, to, to, to topple that. So yeah, you're having exposure to post-colonial theory in other contexts would make it easier for you to make that leap and see it but most people don't study that they never learn it so they, they can't really do it i think that honestly it's one of the reasons i advocate for a lot of people if you're trying to to deprogram a, a a zionist use analogies to something that they already do understand if they're if they're sympathetic to any other national liberation struggle anywhere in, in the world you can use that as a way of helping people to understand this is why it happens. This is why people fight. It's the same shit, but it's, it's, um, but it's really hard for people to relate to, you know, to, to get past it, especially when the oppressors look more like you. Cause again, there's that subtly encoded racism everywhere. Oh, somebody else remember that commercial. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's terrible. But it's, it's stuck. <laughs> I remember it. Yeah, I started repeating some of the stuff that people were saying to my mom. And my mom goes, that sounds pretty Islamophobic. And I had to sit there for a good hour and go, holy fuck. She's right. And it was. And it was like, if I am using a ruler to measure uh, my ability to stand up for people uh in the united states and i'm not using that same ruler for palestinians then what am i doing and um the other thing is a lot of the misinformation and um i think uh revisionist history is it's not easily uh i mean it it's more easily uh debunked online than people think and this goes back to, I think, you talking about the amount of, like, records that you can have access to in Israel. Um, I pretty easily found access to a whole document summarizing um, the Nakba. And it was based on documents released in the 80s. And it went through every single village, all 400. And the reasons why, what happened to that village. If it was... If did they leave on their own? Were they told to leave? Or was it violence? Or was it this? And um, they're using real Israeli documents. So there you can't deny it once you really look at the... That's the thing. <laughs> People have an aston... Human beings have an astonishing capacity to rationalize. We can, we can deny anything. Um, the... Uh, the, the fact that they, they can look the evidence right in the eyes and say no. I mean, come on, there, there's fucking flat earthers all over the place. 
or okay, here's a a, a, a fun example in the uh, in the chat here. Um, Hublis was saying that um, that Canada, if they invade the U.S., that'll solve the problem because a whole bunch of Americans would immediately side up with the with, with the Canadians. I can't remember what the what percentage it was, but it was some absurdly high number there. But what that would actually do, if if the if the Canadians attacked the U.S. It would push the U.S. farther to the right, and 99% of people here would take would, would get whipped up into a whole lot of like patriotic fervor to defend the country. It 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 cannot be no almost no Americans to support that. Tons of Americans who tell you right now, I love Canada and Canada's great. Canada's this that and the other freedom. They would become rabidly anti-Canadian if an if an attack like that happened. It's just not how this stuff works ever not to mention the fact that they would get their ass handed to them in one day that's a whole separate issue there militarily it's a fucking joke but um uh, in just the term in terms of social psychological sense there is literally no scenario i can imagine in which americans don't get whipped up in a whole lot of patriotic fervor to defend it even if americans had fallen into some kind of like handmaid's tale gilead sort of environment most americans would still oppose a military intervention and, and would think that we should solve the problem ourselves it's just not how this stuff works i mean try to find me a situation in the world where any country has been happy about an invasion and annexation just it's it's so astonishingly uncommon in world history and never mind the fact that the u.s is a deeply indoctrinated um you know society here yeah, Ko kosovo I, guess, I don't know how did you take from that thinking that i'm a nationalist i'm describing basic social psychology i'm describing what people would do and honestly, cheering any country, whether it's Canada or the U.S., is the same patriotic bullshit. Anyway, why would I cheer any country attacking the U.S., much less this country existing at all? I don't think countries should exist. So that's a wild misreading of things. I'm just pointing out that Americans wouldn't go for that shit, that most of them would just rally around the, the, the government and fight back. Like, look at the, um, look at the, uh, uh I thought it was frothed right away because, because honestly, I think it's a batshit fucking crazy idea. And it's just so harmful to spread ideas that empirically stupid. It's literally what Iraq said about um, the Arabic speakers in Khuzestan of Iran, that those Arabic speakers would welcome the attack when the Iraqis moved in. They did exactly the opposite. They rallied around the Iranian government and fought the invasion, despite being Arabic speakers. But they were still Iranian, so it just it there's there's no there's no positive examples of this that you that you can point to. So that, to make an argument like that, it just it it it, it just takes you so far away from the actual problems that it's not at all helpful. I did have a question I thought of when uh, whenever you want to move on from the topic. I don't know. Oh, uh, whatever, whatever. I just saw something in the chat that seemed worth responding to. I, I don't, I, I honestly don't get how people get caught up into things like that, you know? Well, I had, they tried to tell me that, they tried to, I work for, you know, I work in AI. I, I, I know I've programmed LLMs. He tried to tell me something about AI earlier, so wouldn't worry about it. Or they, excuse me, but I'm sure they're a nice person uh, and some people love them very much, so all good um but i did want to ask because i got in an issue or, or i got into a debate with kind of just an argument with somebody the other day about the age group um because and i wasn't saying this to slander them uh, but i was asked personally do you support the age group and i said well in terms of action i would say that in general yes you know i'm fine with fighting for autonomy and liberation and given the circumstances yes but ideologically i would consider them an islamist group and i, I don't uh, support that ideology um and i and then they tried to argue that they're not an islamist group uh, do you think that uh, i don't know do you think there's any validity validity to that and more broadly what constitutes an islamist group is there, are you asking, is there any validity to the idea that Hamas is not an Islamist group? 
uh, well, yes, um, and also, or, or whether there's validity to the notion that it is, and then more broadly, what would constitute an Islamist group? An Islamist group is a group organized around political Islam. Political Islam is the idea that Islam should be the dominant force in politics, i.e. that whatever governing institutions you have should be built around Islamic principles and Islamic law. So Hamas is, or H group or whatever, they are by definition an Islamist group. They're not a global jihadi group or whatever, I'm, a J word, but I'm supposed to use for that one. Um, they're not that because they are nationalist Islamists, but they are absolutely an Islamist group because they think that um, the governing structure should be built around Islam. Now, they have tempered that a lot in more recent years and calling for a broader democratic framework and, you know, like voting for everybody and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it's possible that they could evolve in the way that honestly, a lot of Islamist groups would evolve if they actually had governing responsibilities. The fact that they've run the strip for a long time has done exactly what I keep saying it would do everywhere. It tempers you. It, it makes you a little bit more practical. When you suppress groups as say Egypt or Algeria have done, it makes them a lot more aggressive. And uh, whereas if, if they have to be involved in governing, they tend to, I don't know, <laughs> balance things out a lot more. Think about a lot of the Christian parties in Europe. You know, you're, a lot of your um, explicitly Christian themed political parties in Europe were arguing that Christianity and Christian law should govern things. Like that that's what you should base everything around your Christian values. And at the end of the day, that's no really different than, than Islamism is. But in no case at, at, at this point, outside of like the far right ones, but I mean like the, the mainstream, like your like your, your Christian Democratic Union in Germany, for example, they don't believe in imposing Christian values on other people, you know, uh, not even on other Christians, much less on non-Christians, where Islamist politics do in general they are fine with imposing um, uh, Islamic law on people, you know, like, you know, is Islamist rule on other people. Um, but when you actually have governing responsibility, it does tend to temper you. It tends to push that further away. So in the long run, H group is on the same kind of trajectory as a lot of those other parties in Europe. And honestly, the where a lot of Islamist parties could have been in other um, parts of the Middle East if those um, if they had been integrated into the political environment in a more peaceful way and participated in multi-party democracies rather than being consistently suppressed by authoritarian states. Um, Honestly, one re one one uh, interesting thing about the Palestinian situation is that that they because they don't have, they're not under an authoritarian Arab regime. It's a little easier for them to to I don't know go through some of these experiments like politically and and uh, go through these the different learning stages there. Like the Strip is a hemmed in giant outdoor prison, but they actually get to govern themselves and they have direct responsibility for how shit gets done inside those areas. So they, they're having to, to deal with some of that kind of crap in the way that a lot of Islamist parties simply are not, because at best they're opposition, you know, and in most cases they're just literally illegal um, act, uh, groups. So I don't know, short, short is again, again, and Islamist groups are ones that are for political Islam, i.e. Islam should be involved in politics directly. Um, H group fits that directly. Um, and we, we shouldn't dance around that. They do have a lot of hardcore, you know, and, and fairly conservative Islamic views, and they have frequently argued for use of Islamic law. Um, but it is tempered a bit um, by some of their experience in governance in the last 15 years or so. And I think in the long run, it wouldn't have to stay that way. So it it's, uh, just depends on in what context or, or when you're asking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that was generally my impression too. But I, I guess it's also it, it can be a like pro-Israel talking point or something. Um, especially maybe if if. Um,
Now, I'm, I'm still kind of tripped out by this, the, the thing about, like, the Canadian Commonwealth stuff there. Like, I mean, it is... I mean, I think not, it's just kind of reactionary. I mean... Yeah, it's, it's just nonsensical. It's not remotely accurate that a third of Americans wanted to become Canadian or like wanted the states to secede and join Canada. It's a really, really fringe idea. Most people in different states in the U.S. don't even want to secede, you know, in any way, you know, from the U.S. I mean, like, you know, the, the whole Cal exit stuff, the, the Texas one, they're not going to go anywhere at all. Most of the population is going to shoot it down, you know, much less the idea of joining another country after centuries of propaganda making you think you're an American. You know, it, it's, it challenges people's basic identities, you know, and, and again, in a very much a social psychology way, it's just flip it around. Ask if, uh, ask if Canadians would want to be Americans because the country's richer. If they could keep some of the same like healthcare benefits, everything else, what now, would you want to be in a larger, richer country? Most people are like, uh, no, because people usually don't want to be part of a different country. It's really kind of difficult to do. It's a it's a hard sell to change things along those ways and changing things in a way that breaks a part of a country out to create another country is a whole different idea from linking territories together, which, which is why areas get more and more fragmented areas get smaller and smaller. Look at look at look at a map of Europe 100 years ago and today and just see how many more countries there are. But in, in none of these places do you see countries get larger at the expense of other ones in the, in the contemporary period. It's just not the direction everything has been going. You, you, people aren't being like, oh yeah, I totally want to join this other country. I think that they're better. You know, it, it, it just, it doesn't matter. I mean, look at the way the uh, Brits couldn't even handle the European Union as loose as that is. You're thinking like, okay, Commonwealth kind of stuff like the EU structure is a lot looser there. And a lot of Brits were genuinely unhappy about what little sovereignty they'd given up to that. You know, and a lot of Europeans and tons of other countries, you know, like the, 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 the French, the Dutch, tons of other people, they're happy with some aspects of it, but they really hate the idea of a United States of Europe. A lot of the founders, uh, a lot of people didn't want to leave in the first place. The country as a whole is, you know, all of the English in particular are still kind of happy with what they did. The Scots were never happy with it. Uh, but the the Monet and Schumann in, in, in drafting the, the basic plans for um, the coal and steel community and laying down some of the foundations of what would eventually become the, uh, the European community, they were aiming at a United States of Europe. That idea is nonsensical to most Europeans. It just doesn't make it, it, I mean, they've had 75 years to sell people on this and people genuinely hate the idea it's a very very small part of the population that likes it um so it's it's very difficult to get people to accept the idea of joining a different political organization a larger political organization or another country like you know falling into some super state one of the reasons a lot of people dislike the idea of a, a european super state is that some larger um societies end up dominating it like you know people would think oh the germans will just take over because there's a lot of them you know uh, so there's that kind of uh, knee-jerk resentment and that's the same basic um social psychological dynamic that you see there in resistance to german domination that you'd see in in, in like this U.S. Canada kind of idea, it's it's just never been a common view. It's a it's a fringe view. It definitely is there. It's never been a common view, and sure as hell wouldn't be a third of the population. So I mean, I don't know. I just I I I can't wrap my head around that one. I mean, just there's so many counterexamples. I would have loved it if the the Europeans managed to get their shit together. You know, and, and, and create, a, you know, some kind of larger framework there because it would have been a nice counterbalance in some ways to, to U.S. domination. Um, they, they might have had an easier time tackling issues like climate change. Who the hell knows? But it, but it, if it's organized around some neoliberal bullshit, it wouldn't have helped anyway. <clears throat> so who knows? But a, uh, a lefty United States of Europe would have been nice, <laughs> you know, like, because I think nationalism is fucking horrifying. You know, the idea of focusing on the difference. Oh, you speak French, therefore I must hate you. Like, why? Why? How does that threaten anybody? Like, it, it doesn't matter. I don't think borders should exist anywhere. I don't think countries should exist. So that's just me. But um, most people have been conditioned, you know, over many generations to think in exactly the opposite way. So it's really hard for me to, to 
to get how anybody can look around at the people around them and think that that somehow that I don't know they're <laughs> more like us. <laughs> We're not that common. <laughs> Yeah, and starting a war and having, like, Canada, like, come in and take part of our land, that's just not a recipe for anything good. And I think the guy was trying to say that there are states that want to succeed, secede, but to get to those states, you got to go through, like, five states. Yeah, and like, even there, there is, there is no state anywhere in the country where you can find more than a quarter of people that want that. It's tiny. Like, I'd be shocked if any of them were anywhere near as high as a quarter. I mean, the Cal Exit idea is a fuck. Uh, under Trump, this is advanced too. Like, and, and Californians, a lot of Californians hated Trump. And most of the Californians who hated Trump the most were still deeply opposed to the idea of putting a secession idea on the ballot. You know, I mean, even among like right wingers in Texas, it's a minority position. And it's only the right wingers who care about it. You know, it just. <laughs> I'll give you get back. <laughs> uh, uh... That's a threat. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's it's um, it's funny the number of uh, Americans who moved up there and and uh, Quebecois who moved south too. There's there's uh, all through the northeast. There's such an interesting like. You know back and forth so much population exchange you know, between them that it's it's astonishing that people have such strong views that they do but again nationalism is a, is a weird freaking disease you know i mean the so many people in the area are perfectly happy re, you know remembering their quebecois ancestry and yet they live in the u.s and speak english at this point you know like A whole bunch of like muted user, user, user. Do we do we have a whole bunch of like spam accounts joining here? Jeez. Not too many, but enough that I I block and then I mute, so that's why it comes up. There are these like weird user number ones. I think uh, I wonder if a lot of them use the weird ass names like that just because it's harder to remember and like type in a name to look them up because it's just. If you don't put in a name when you're making your account, that's what it'll automatically title it. Um, yeah, but if you use your account for two days, it should be kind of obvious that you don't want I me, mean, like you should see your name and like, hey, that's a really weird name for me. It's changing. <laughs> yeah, some people have caught on that maybe they'll get, or they don't know. Some people just, I've had people like come up and didn't even know they could make a username. Thank you, thank Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But I look farther than. Your follower list is not uh, immune from my, uh, what do you call it, background check. <laughs> right. I think Quebec wants to be annexed from Canada because their, their health care has such long uh, wait times. Yeah, that's an interesting one too. Like the, um, as strong as the the national identities are in in places like Quebec and Scotland, they still couldn't pull off uh, independence referenda. So I mean, there there's plenty of people who <clears throat> want out in both places, but not quite enough yet. I mean, it would just be a really sad economy, and we're kind of living in a time where things are very competitive. Yeah, in both cases, too. I mean, you, you, you take a major hit in living standards. I mean, the Scottish population is freaking tiny, and much of the land is not really usable or arable, you know? Um, there's a reason most of the population is, is, has always been, you know, <laughs> much further south. So, I mean, it's... I, I get the... The desire in a lot of circles for it but there's plenty of people that are like yeah that'd be kind of cool but i also it's not worth it to be poor you know and frankly 
there are a lot of Americans who would make that kind of calculation about Canada, strangely enough. Um, although Canadian living standards are actually considerably higher than Americans, but we're massively propagandized to think that we're like this super rich, awesome country, despite being out of the top 20 in every positive metric. Plus, are they getting a new currency? They don't want their new currency to be matched to the dollar. They're gonna... What was that? Or if, if this... Okay, if this... If, like, Quebec, an independent Quebec, right? Or, or say, an independent Texas, right? They don't want to be put on the do dollar with their new currency. It's gonna fold their whole economy. I mean, yeah. I mean, the... Creating creating a new currency and then having a, a, having to have the, the exchange rates just so so that trade is is actually favorable for you because yeah if your if your currency is worth too little or too much it can really affect your trade so yeah there's a, a whole lot of complications for people I mean can you imagine like uh, so many goods go in and out of Texas from other states and if they were to secede. Who's to say what kind of trade deal they'd get, you know, or how expensive it would be to move things back and forth? What if their system is different? If they're, if they start creating a massively different regulatory climate, because I think that's one of the reasons that they would want to secede, or at least the the idiots there would want to secede. Well, then we could just say, hey, we don't want like have your dirty polluting trucks in our country, and your trucks can't come in anymore, and then okay, there's a problem, right? You know, the the cost to, to do currency exchange, everything else. One of the reasons that for for so many countries in Europe, and especially for the business class, they love the euro, is that it lowers the cost of doing business. Well, creating a, a, a Texas-sized country and economy with a different currency would increase the cost of doing business in Texas. Last time they tried to do it, it just they just fell apart until they begged to join. I mean, they uh, they fought for independence from Mexico because it was a bunch of like white supremacist settlers who wanted to to, to be part of the U.S. in the first place, and they uh, they they couldn't get permission through through Washington to actually annex them. They tried it immediately. Can you please annex us? Like, mm, no, we can't pass it because no one wants to take another slave state into the Union. So they were forced to be a country for a decade, and they didn't like it. <laughs> like it. And people now look back at that and they like romanticize it. Oh, we were free. We were ah. But they don't understand that their own political class never wanted to be a country at any point. It's so funny to think about the way people twist these things in their own memories. Like, well, historical memory. Yeah. Oh, um, for, to, um, so, uh, anti-Christpitalism. Uh, for, for currencies, the, the big issue there, it, it costs money to do, ex to do conversions. You know, when, when, with with goods moving back and forth, and you have to constantly keep track of exchange rates. And exchange rates, as they as they shift and change, can um, can um, can make things more or less favorable for um, for moving goods. But even if uh, in the 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 conditions where somehow it's cheaper for you to sell things, and people are more interested in buying your stuff, um, which um, usually comes with certain disadvantages, like you know having a weaker currency, which hurts you in some ways internally, but it can sell you some more goods. But even there, you still have the co the basic cost of uh, of conversion, and constant conversion for every freaking transaction, moving things around. It, it's just sort of like um, why don't why are there so few measurement systems in the world? You know why is why is basically like what only three countries don't use metric for everything and technically the u.s is officially metric but we don't use it for a damn thing but technically speaking we're supposed to uh but almost everyone is metric because it's easier if you have to do constant conversions from one system to the next that costs money you have to have people and software and everything else doing that for you in every possible transaction it's just not desirable in a larger economy so, you know, the, the issue with currencies is actually pretty similar to the one with, with measures in the sense of just adding an additional cost to business. And when your economy is, is based so much in trade, in moving goods around, which that, that's true for the entire U.S., Texas included, um, it would increase the cost of doing business. And a lot of the country companies that have been moving to Texas 
would find it harder. And a lot of the companies that have been settling in Texas too, they like the fact that it's really close to the southern border and that we have uh, we have NAFTA and they can easily trade things back and forth. The, the, the same idiots that want Texas to, to secede want to close the border completely and keep the, the state from getting any more brown. So it would again massively increase costs and cut them off from a ton of things economically. So the border issue is a whole other question there. Most people, even in Texas, would look at the idea, the costs of seceding and what it would do to them, like, you know, the, the issues around the border and everything else, like, you know, and, and say, no, it's not worth it. We might dislike Washington. We might dislike brown people or whatever else, but, but it's not worth it to us. You know, it's going to cause too many other problems. Yeah, and that's pretty much the, 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 the case anywhere. You know, people aren't really going to be want, willing to do that sort of thing. I employed how many people? Is that a question to me? I think they think you're talking about a business you owned. No, I'm talking about economics, not running a business, and those are completely different subjects. Running a business has fuck all to do with economics. Like nothing. They're different subjects for a reason. Something that I think would be useful is if you define what dollarization is. Like putting other people on, the, on, on uh, there. The, this video, uh, this thing just finished rendering. Hold on a second. Um, I'm not sure I understood that either. I'm going to ask you. Uh, um, okay. Uh, okay. There goes the next, next, next. All right, got the last two weeks worth of these things up onto YouTube. Uh, okay, uh, dollarization. What about dollarization? It's like when, um, like, when the United States has put other countries on the dollar and then it's tanked their currency. I mean, the, there are a lot of countries that consciously choose to align their currency with the dollar or peg it to the dollar. And that actually used to be extremely common. It was actually one of the major elements of the entire Bretton Woods architecture after World War II. Uh, most currencies were pegged to the dollar and therefore to U.S. gold reserves. So they all stayed kind of like the same there. But when uh, Nixon free floated our currency um, and moved us finally fully off the, the, the gold standard, um, then it became much more problematic for other countries to be pegged to the dollar, so people started moving away from it and set it into, you know, created other currency systems for themselves. Economics is not a bit, what, Com what? Yes, I'm an anarchist. Okay. Uh, I, hold on a second, I, I think we've got a, Sorry, I had to take a minute to block an imbecile. I get, I get no patience for that kind of shit. Yeah, they're gone. Somebody yelling, communist, anarchist, uh, at me like it's an insult. Like, okay, yes, I, I, I don't lick boots. It's not an insult. Um, yeah, the, with, with, um, with the U.S. currency in its own kind of free float, that is advantageous to the U.S. Um, because it allows us to fund all of our spending by producing dollars, uh, just crank out more of that, and then count on it being made up somehow by economic growth, which as long as growth rates are high, it doesn't matter if you print more dollars. Granted, you do have to, you know, increase people's wages, otherwise you, you hurt ordinary people. But from the state's perspective, think about the states, right? For governments there, the individual government that has a fiat currency doesn't hurt them at all. For another country to be tied to you, that can be harmful to you now. Which is one of the reasons that after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, everyone moved away from those kind of like pegs unless they're kind of like forced into it by different economic circumstances. And when people have tried to do that, one of the biggest problems there is it takes away... It's similar to what happened to, say, um, a lot of the southern European economies once they joined the euro. Because... Greece could count on the fact that every time they fucked up and they 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 they, they spent too much, they could lower they, they could um, um, devalue the drachma and they'd be fine, and they could do that. But they they couldn't do that anymore. Once they joined the eurozone, then uh, you know currency is managed out of Frankfurt and they can't devalue anymore. So 
um, they actually have real debt now. Uh, whereas debt to yourself, debt within a sovereign economy doesn't work that way. That when people talk about the U.S. national debt all the time, the U.S. national debt is mostly a spook. It's not really a debt. It's like an accounting trick. You're, you, you owe yourself money. It, it doesn't make any damn sense. Um, but if you, um, if you have debt and your currency is tied to another currency that you can't devalue, then if you run into trouble, you're just fucked and you end up defaulting. That was the situation you have with places like Argentina, right? Where they, uh, with a dollar peg, they can't devalue the currency, so you're, you're kind of stuck. Or if, you know, and without a dollar peg, they can devalue the currency and then the currency just collapses. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's problematic either way, but the shift to dollarization is driven in some cases by demands from the big lending institutions to try and make it a, a better bet. We are unwilling to invest in your country because we expect you may just devalue the lira again. Because again, Turkey did this a lot, Italy did this a lot, you know, Greece did this a lot. We don't want to invest in your country because we're afraid you might just like devalue things and that costs us money because you know, if your money isn't worth as much when you pay us back, then we're making less money. So a peg makes you more attractive to lenders. It makes you more attractive to like the, you know, the, the big international institutions, IMF or whatever, or major banks or whatever that could grant you loans that your country needs. But if you are pegged to the dollar, you can't devalue if you run into trouble. So it means you have to be, you have, the country has to be run well, because if you fuck up and you, you overspend or something there, or, you know, you mess up in taxes on kinds of other things, there's just tons of things that can go wrong that way that, that often lead people to a need to devalue, but you no longer have that option. You know, you're, you're, you're trapped at that point. So it's realistically, those pegs are only really good for the banking class. <laughs> They're not really generally good for um, a country per se. But neither necessarily is having um, um, a very badly run um, economy too. So governments can genuinely make things kind of screwed up. You know, it's. Um, I, I I think that there are serious problems with the imposed austerity that you have, for example, in the eurozone. Um, where a lot of the countries of Southern Europe are genuinely fucked because they have decades worth of massive debt that they now can't handle as much. Italy's sovereign debt is fucking humongous. Um, and because they're in the Eurozone now, there's not much they can do about it. They're no longer a currency sovereign, so their debt really hurts. Where their debt was, a, was huge, but it didn't hurt them in the same way before. But it also made it harder for them to get a lot of like you know the the kind of loans and, and business growth that they could have gotten otherwise too. So it's it's tricky. But honestly, being a currency sovereign is simply easier in a capitalist economy. Again, this is all capitalist economics for the you know for, <laughs> for the, it's, um, nothing to do with the way I would want to do anything. But <clears throat> anyway, I don't know if that makes sense or, or it touches your question at all. But as soon as you you get dollarization, I I start rambling. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And we had a bunch of like follow up questions too. Number one, uh, do anarchists believe in money? Yeah. Uh, um, do cats believe in God? I mean, it's just it's an impossible question to answer. Like it, like it. The, some do, some don't. You know, it, there's no there's no anarchists answer to that question. Um, I, for example, don't have a problem with uh, uh, decentralized market e economics that aren't capitalist. So I would have no problem with money because I think that some basic unit of exchange is practical um, in a way that um, uh, sharing economies or planned economies or any of the other models there that move away totally from money are harder to implement, um, certainly on the scales that we're used to living in. And we live in a far more complex world. If we were talking about anarchism three centuries ago, I'd say we're, we're fine without money, you know, very small scale. But um, moving away entirely from a, a, a currency-based economy just makes it so much harder to deal with 
so many issues on a global scale, and there are way too many billions of us to make it really um, practicable, I would think. In the long run, now, if you're taking, talking a, a, a few centuries from now of, of real development, then yeah, I think we can get to some kind of Star Trek economy, totally post-scarcity, whatnot. I think that all of that is doable, and we can eventually go away with it and just have a basic kind of, um, I don't know, you got to have some way of keeping track of, um, you know, um, how to get or move things around. But, you know, a, a purely money concept could conceivably go away, even in a very complex society. But it would take a lot of incremental steps along the way to make that realistic. To ditch money anytime soon doesn't make sense to me personally. There are plenty of anarchists, though, that have no problem going full, you know, full bore, instant revolution, abolish money, everything else. And, you know, but again, anarchists don't agree with each other on anything. So that's to be expected. Um, this next one is about bricks and if they will have any significant impact on money in a general sense. No, I don't think so. Um, the idea of them collaborating in a way sufficient to create an alternative reserve currency of some sort in the current economic system is almost inconceivable. Um, and they all do still need to deal with um, the way the current economy is, is structured. As long as you're in a capitalist economy, not really, no. Um, I, I have a hard time even seeing how it'll be an effective um, political or economic counterweight in any way because the basic interests of the countries are often so at odds with one another. Um, they, they don't really get along well enough as an economic block, much less a political block. Um, it's in many ways, and this is one of the reasons that I like talking about things like capitalism in the sense of like the long delay. Um, uh, it's, it's a trap. Once you set off down these roads, it's actually very difficult to get out of them in any way. I mean, at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets were still absolutely integrated into the global capitalist economy and they were buying American wheat. There's no way really out of it without undermining the structure as a whole. Like the, 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 the modern world system is gonna keep trundling on no matter what any individual country does. And having a few other countries in a regional block, you know, if the, if the, if the Chinese and Russians and everybody else is all, all getting along somehow well, if the architecture hasn't changed any, it doesn't make any damn difference. It becomes exactly the same thing. And all it does is it changes which suited arsehole is in charge. Like nothing, nothing gets better. It doesn't fix anything. So I, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that, um, I don't know that would really help. Oh, there's, is that, uh, somebody's username is in cuneiform and they got blocked already. How did that happen? Oh, sorry. They said they were the king of Israel. That's weird. I took a screenshot if you want to look at it later. Well, it's just, it's just a strange statement. <laughs> like, um, I mean, I mean, they could just be some random nutter or somebody telling a weird joke. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they think they're Jesus or something. <laughs> um, but uh, having a username in cuneiform is actually kind of badass. I didn't know you could do that. Um, if you got a screenshot of the name, send it to me later. I want to, I want to, I want to look up what it means. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do. I'll send it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cute. Um, okay. It is surprisingly challenging to write in cuneiform on a whiteboard in a classroom. I, I'll tell you from experience, it's weird. It does not make sense. <laughs> I've never tried, but... Yeah, but to, to write like, you know, Akkadian or Sumerian words down, it just looks so weird. It just, it doesn't look right at all. It just looks like these weird... It, it just looks like garbage. Like, what is this? <laughs> But, you know, in, in, in a, a nice little carving, it's like, oh, that's really badass looking. And then as soon as you take your white, <laughs> white pen, you know, markers out, like, what is this? Yeah, I, I, this was a while back, and it's a little off topic, but I saw something cool that was comparing the different um, cultures' way of writing. So whether it was on papyrus or clay or tablets or whatever it was, and then 
the form of their strokes took uh, the form that they were literally able to do on stone. Like you can't you can't do certain curved things on stone, but you could do it on paper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the cuneiform is designed to be pressed into wet clay. You know, so and the shape of the stick really kind of matters. It's it's actually really kind of kind of a tricky art to you know you you're putting it at a different different angles depending on how, how you're pressing them in. But it's um it's designed for clay. So if you're not using clay, it doesn't make sense, which is why as they moved away from that medium, the writing system died out. Um, the, the Egyptian one is interesting because everyone only thinks about the hieroglyphs, but hieroglyphs were really only for ceremonial purposes. So they're like gonna be carved into like temple walls or whatever, but they're not how people wrote on papyrus. You know, the stuff on papyrus, the hieratic script looks very different. But the way it, it, it works on there, it has a lot to do with the way that the reeds are pressed together and the, and the way that you can press on them, like the, the type of stylus you're using also would matter. And writing on papyrus is different from writing on animal skins. So it does shift the way that people actually write things. It, yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting how the mediums really um, have, have always affected stuff, you know? It's honestly fascinating that we all managed to transition to Chinese paper because there were so many other ways of doing it beforehand. And then, oh, the Chinese solved everything by inventing paper. <laughs> so we all moved away from everything else. Okay, next question. How were we all convinced a free market can exist under capitalism? <laughs> um, yeah, that's fascinating, especially for the... Uh, for the nutters who think that capitalism is free markets, which is just nuts. I mean, markets have existed in every economic system that so far exists in the world. So to think that somehow markets and free markets are a capitalist thing is just absurd. But, but yeah, the idea that, that somehow the capitalist system would make markets freer is a huge, um, like accomplishment for propaganda because it really just doesn't make any sense you you have the, the way that you do it and and i see this a lot in um the oh wait there's a oh look at that one of the um the one of those office hours videos i uploaded like from the one from two weeks ago they put a little copyright thing on there they found copyrighted content on one of these what uh the the um, idea of free markets and capitalism is so fundamentally absurd that the, the only way to do it is to get people to misapprehend what capitalism means. And that's the, the real trick. Most people who believe this stuff have no clue what capital is or what makes capitalism capitalism. So of course it, it makes a certain amount of sense. You know, if you think that capitalism means trade, then it's it, it just becomes like a like a like a kind of tautology you know um capitalism can have free trade because capitalism is free trade and i've heard that from so many libertarians that that's their definition of capitalism is free trade like no capitalism means concentration of capital in the hands of an investor class who then invests that in exchange in, in, in expectation of profit for themselves that that's that's capitalism capitalism is about capital it has nothing to do with the the trade or markets or anything else those are just features that are part of it but they're part of tons of other economic systems too i think that it works for people because almost no one you meet has any idea what capitalism even is they just think that it's the market system that it's market exchange capitalism is i can run my own plumbing business like think of that that dude before it's like hey, did you want to run your own business well, okay you can run your own business they think that having your own small business makes you a capitalist and that's capitalism and going to the store and buying stuff is capitalism like it's not so i i think that that's the the way that that question kind of works is if you just don't know what it even is then of course the propaganda can work at that point yeah, exactly. Especially when if you actually look at the economic policy of especially like the Soviet Union, 
and the like Eastern Bloc in general, there was constant trade between all of the SSRs. So the idea that there you don't have trade under socialism is just absurd. Yeah, it is. Uh, apparently, um, for 50 seconds during a eight hour live, they think that they heard a piece of the song Spanish Flea by Herb, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. What? <laughs> I mean, Herb Alpert is cool, but I can't, I can't say I've put on a Herb Alpert record in probably decades at this point. So I, But it's I not a familiar. bad idea. I mean, sure, yeah, this is some good stuff, but I mean... <laughs> Did somebody did somebody two weeks ago play some Herb Alpert? I mean, <laughs> cool. But, but yeah, and, I, and the way you articulated that is so perfect because I've been in a lot of lives lately because obviously due to the um, election, quote unquote, coming up, a lot of people are discussing a lot more economic policy stuff. And it's like, it's, I don't even really mind that people don't know this about socialist countries. It's that so many of them don't know and aren't interested. You, 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 you give of yourself and try to educate them on this stuff and they just don't care. Yeah, they, they're, they're convinced that they already know what socialism means, what capitalism means. And I, I run into people every freaking day that hate socialism and have no fucking idea what it means. I had an exchange this morning with somebody on threads that at the end of it, I finally found out that what he thought socialism was, was, was he, what he thought the mainstream, his word of socialism was, was social democracy. I'm like, Social no, democracy that's, that's capitalism is still ideology. It's literally capitalism with a welfare state. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, you know, like it's you know everyone everyone has an opinion about these things, and they often have no clue where the starting point is. They they're arguing completely out of ignorance, but it's difficult to deal with because people really often don't want to know that they don't know yeah, something on a basic level. It's scary. It, it, it's, it decenters them to point out that they're, they have a, a basic ignorance. This is one of the reasons I, I like one of the much earlier points from tonight about uh, when, when the people were still here that like, honestly, I'm fine being ignorant of things. <laughs> like I want to constantly learn something new, but a lot of people find their own ignorance terrifying. So yeah, if you if you point out no, actually you're kind of arguing with the dictionary here and literally every work of political philosophy. Can we take a step back and start over? And they're like, nah, 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 nah. and then because they saw some memes somewhere and well, well, yeah, happened. especially over the whole market thing because like, hello, Yugoslavia existed. They were a market socialist nation. There you go. I, and, and I point that out all the time. I could I couldn't tell you how people have never even heard of market socialism. I mean, like. Like, uh, uh, it is a thing. Like, we're, we're, yeah, yeah, market socialism. It is a thing. Like, people do it. Like, it's, and, and whether statist or non statist, market socialism is an actual thing. And everyone's just like, what? How can you have a market economy and socialism? Like, uh, your problem is you have no idea what capitalism is. In fact, it's easier to have a market economy without capitalism. Yes. Yeah, it's absurdly easier. I, and but, but what's difficult about it is getting people to understand that because they've learned to associate markets with capitalism. And there is a particular type of capitalist market economy that everyone's just sort of used to, and it makes sense to them on some level. And it's really hard for them to like take a, an imaginative leap into something that's very, very different. Um, oh, sorry, Bert. Uh, a market economy is, is basic exchange. So um, uh, you, want, you, you want me to mow your lawn and you're going to offer me some money for that. And then I'm going to take that money down to um, uh, the local, you know, uh, convenience store and, and buy myself a bottle of water. And then the guy that uh, sold me the bottle of water is going to take that money and use it to purchase more goods to stock on his shelves. That That's a market economy. It's just basic exchange. And especially like, even if 
Like, they, aside from the fact that I'm personally a communist, the thing that bothers me is that the history of socialist experiments and actually existing socialist states is a part of world history. If you don't know that stuff, you literally don't know world history. You objectively do not. Yeah, and I get that all the time with the people who are like, uh, well, socialism has always failed. Like, um... It never no, failed. It, it kind of never fails. Um, but what they can't do is that they're, they're conflating the politics and the economics. So, the Soviet state failed, and arguably, really, uh, most or all of these socialist economies have failed in political terms because of, I don't know, political prisoners or gulags or whatever you want to do. Like, there, there's always problems with the politics of it, but politics and economics are two different fucking things. Your economic system, the Soviet economic system, actually worked, and it caused higher rates of growth than the, the capitalist economies of Western Europe were. Um, but politically, it was kind of fucked up because you know, they retained a lot of the um, authoritarian tyrannical structure of the old czarist regime. I mean, they just rebranded the czarist secret police and kept it going. I mean, uh, all that, okay, we can criticize that, but they think that that means the failure, and that's, that's nonsensical. Well, yeah, and that's the thing, because communists do critique that stuff. That's the whole point behind critical support. You can say, I want, the, I want this experiment to succeed, but if you want something to succeed, you want it to be the best thing it can be. You don't Someday, just say, to be fair, it's the Soviet, Soviet Union, so it's perfect. It's like that's... people who, who refused to critique it. Just like uh, there, there's, tons of, there's tons of socialists out there that defend um, Chinese repression. You know, in in um, in in um, in Turkestan or Hong Kong or anything else, or they they they're totally fine defending that. They defend the conquest of Tibet, like they they just line up to to swallow whatever line of bullshit there. There there's tons of people who, who refuse to see that. When when people were talking about um, revelations of the Gulag system, there were a lot of um, of Western communists who refused to accept it. Jean Paul Sartre, for example, was in massive massive denial about Soviet atrocities. Uh, because he wanted to see the best in it. And granted, Soviet atrocities are still um, uh, barely a pinky scratch compared to like, you know, the, the, the Franco-British atrocities, you know, in Western Europe, but they existed, they were real, and a lot of people suffered. And, but, but sometimes people are like, ah, la, 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 I can't hear it, and they shut that off. A lot of good socialists are critical. Like they, and that kind of like critical, so that there's that kind of self-critique and, and internal critique is really, really important. But there are plenty of people with ideological blinders too, and that's on our side as well as on their side. You know, the, the capitalist side. Yeah, especially um, I can understand those people because so much of what has been stated about the Soviet Union and other existing socialist states isn't true. There's so much of it that is lied about, so it's understandable that you that you can go too far in the other direction and be like, all of it never happened and it's like that's not true either you have to be willing to understand that even staunch members of the communist party in the soviet union were critiquing this and that's the other thing is there was a lot of internal debate inside the party all of the time there was yeah debate inside the party but the party was also sending political prisoners off to gulags so that critique didn't stop some terrible shit from happening. So, no, it, it's just, it, I, I uh, while again, I'm, I completely agree. There's constant internal socialist critique. In fact, that's a significant chunk of what I'm sitting next to over here, um, is critique of socialism by socialists. But there's also a lot of blind, willful blindness in it. Um, just as a fun one there, reason I stepped out of the room and I missed part of the, what you said, um, there was a large spider that drowned in my water so whoops <clears throat> yeah i i empathize on that because i literally had a fly crap basically crashing into the surface of my coffee the other day and i'm like well i'm not drinking that now yep i'm not gonna drink that fly no no no, no thanks <laughs> that's uh, that's gone <laughs> but yeah and it's like the thing that annoys me the most especially because it's the socialist experiment closest to us is the amount of sheer nonsense promulgated about Cuba, like the amount of sheer malarkey, to borrow a phrase from our current president, 
that is yes, just yes. uncritically yes. spewed by people who just don't, frankly, don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, honestly, yes. On the one hand, does Cuba have political prisoners? Yes, but so does the U.S. So, set that aside. Uh, almost every possible other way, it's all just bullshit. Almost everything that we say about Cuba is nonsensical. And people are always like, oh, well, they, they make so little money. I'm like, yeah, because most things they get are free. So it's, I mean... So they don't... First of all, they're they don't need as much money because they're not paying right. for everything. Right. Their living standards are among the highest in Latin America. <clears throat> um, but yeah, compared to like somebody well off in Miami, sure, they're going to look poor. But they also have fairly high living standards for Latin America. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost entirely nonsensical. And it, it's amazing that they did as well as they did, given how much shit they've taken from the U.S. and Europe over the years. So... Especially, and I found this out by listening to the second season of the podcast, Blowback. Uh, it's kind of America's fault that the Cuban Revolution went fully socialist in the first place, because right after the um, successful ouster of uh, Batista, the, they wanted to stimulate the Cuban economy, so they let in a bunch of Soviet oil tankers and process, wanted to process their crude oil. Well, the American-owned processing companies, processing uh, plants on Cuba didn't like that. So Cuba nationalized. And then uh, the U.S. did a bunch of stuff that I literally can't describe on this live because you're T-group shit. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's actually really common. Um, uh, uh, people like to forget that... Uh, the Vietnamese, like Ho Chi Minh and whatnot, did not turn to the Soviets first. They turned to us first for help against France because they thought, hey, you guys fought a war of independence. You should be on our side. We don't want to live under colonial oppression anymore. Why don't you help us out? And and, and America's like, uh, no, I think I want to give a whole bunch of money to France so they can keep their colonies. And we started paying for France's dirty war to hold on to Indochina. So then they turned to the Soviets. You know, like over and over again, We've created, you know, uh, our own little enemies or whatever here by pushing people farther and farther away, you know, where, yeah, it's just, it, it's so nonsensical. I mean, the, the whole story of the Cold War, it, it's, it's honestly astonishing the degree to which it just replicates the same basic dynamics of the Cold War. You know, the, the way that you create these, these us versus them dynamics, the way that you're manufacturing enemies in order to justify, you know, your own weapon sales and your own kind of... Like, Realist policies. It's so nonsensical. It's the same shit. It's like it was bad enough you people fell for this last time, but you're doing it again. Why? But we just refuse to learn. Um, anyway, um, Emily says there's some ch uh, questions from the chat. We're supposed to kind of like you know take turns and whatnot. Emily and like, okay, yeah. Um, so let's see. Oh, I'm also supposed to ask you, Liam, how much longer do you want to be on? Oh, good question. Let's see. Where can we start? Um, so a little before... A little before um, I don't know, maybe like a, an hour at most. Okay. Um, I I stop earlier. <laughs> so yeah, an hour at most. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, like... Um, um, what would that be? Your 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 ten thirty, I guess. Yeah, ten forty, ten thirty. Um, ten thirty-ish. Yeah, let's do that. Do you need a, a water break? Do you need a spider break? Do I you do need to put more spiders in your water. I had to throw out a bunch of this water because <laughs> you know spider. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go grab a quick drink. Okay. That cool. So, Anna, are you still busy? Bird, what? I'm supposed to be rule bound and professional now in this shit, and I can't. I only slept like three hours. I don't know what you people want from me. Oh, there's another question in the Discord. Okay. I see your, your question, Rebellious. 
the hell? Um, Anna's making bacon. Was the Maoist revolution successful in aggregate for the people of that time? Um, if people have questions, they can come up on the panel. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna miss them in the chat because I'm too sleepy. Oh, maybe we should do it again. I can get some sleep. Um, whilst I was up, I, I took care of a few other things. You know, turn off the air conditioner since we're at sundown. And I have a new, I have a new present sitting outside waiting for me. Ooh. What is it? New sheets. Ooh. <sighs> Fancy. Okay, let me find these questions. Luego de Sabanas. What language is this? Um, badly mangled spot, I guess. <laughs> You're, are you ready for questions, Leah? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. These are completely out of context and I don't know who asked them. These are just in the discord from Anna. Um, how is the Swiss franc worth so much more? That's the whole question. Do you, do you want to riff on that? I mean, it's, it's just basic monetary policy. When governments can keep a currency at whatever they want it to be. Switzerland doesn't have to devalue its currency. It has really good trade relations. It has a really favorable balance of trade. Um, it has um, a few very strong sectors in their economy, so they're pretty fucking rich. Um, they're one of the richest countries in the world. So they've never been forced to keep driving the value of their currency down. Um, this is why it's sort of a fallacy that the U.S. does have to constantly devalue its its own currency by producing too much of it. Um, uh, we really don't need to, we choose to, and in part because we maintain a pretty massively unfavorable trade balance and we refuse actually to, you know, stop building more aircraft carriers and stupid shit. Um, I mean, the U.S. government spends money like water, but no, the the Swiss don't, they don't run up massive spending bills and they still manage to provide an extremely high quality of, of life for people. So they, they just choose to manage their currency differently. That's, that, that's it. I mean, it, there's a currency sovereign does have a great deal of control over how you manage it and what it's worth. And policy matters a lot in that case. Look at, look at Japan. The, the, the Japanese currency is worth practically nothing because they've been in, in deficit spending for what sixty some years straight. <laughs> you know, like they they um they spend way too much freaking money. That's a satisfying answer, I think. I don't know who asked it. The question. Um, okay, do you want the next question? <laughs> um, oh, okay, I remember this one. How, how to achieve anarchism, question mark? Is it a dream or can it somehow be done? Well, that's the $10,000 question. Right? <laughs> um, to the latter, yes, it can be done. To the former, there's a lot of disagreement on that. Um, I can tell you what I think makes sense just based on, I don't know, well, to be frank, connecting it into, to, to history, like to seeing what's, what's worked well and what hasn't, you know, what are the, the, the obstacles? Because if you approach things in a purely theoretical framework, if you approach things purely through the, um, through the ideas, then there's a ton of ways to get there. But as soon as you actually have to start introducing 
the sociology and the history and everything else, like all the stuff that's that's that you can use to understand how some something might play out to, to make basic predictions, then there aren't that many avenues toward it. Um, there are a few, um, but but uh, a lot of them, the the odds are pretty low. Uh, and honestly, the one that people most tend to favor, <laughs> like some kind of direct revolutionary action, is like the absolute worst, um, which is one of the reasons that the anarchists um, sort of faded as a significant force uh, about a century ago. Um, because outside of a few unusual circumstances like civil wars, say in like, Spain, Syria, things like that, then you can carve out a space. But as soon as everything is back to normal, the government's just going to walk in and crush you. So um, it's, it's, it's not very sustainable. Um, and you can see that everything from like the 1870 Paris Commune all the way to the present. Um, I think the way to it is to change the way we think first, to alter the basic social and cultural paradigms. And I think to do that, you can't just approach it in a theoretical sense. You can't just approach the ideas and talk about what would be better and make a good argument for why people would like it, but actually start to show them why it would work. And the way to do that um, is to begin producing really effective functioning institutions already inside the existing society. So you're basically showing anarchism works by showing them it working in their lives, even if there is still the state doing its own thing. So uh, community policing in your area, organize everybody, have your own like kind of community patrols, call us instead, don't call the cops, and then eventually no one ever calls the cops again and, and things still work, then boom, uh, you've shown a, an actual example of how anarchist direct democracies can work. Um, mutual aid societies like taking care of the, the sick, the elderly, you know, like you're, you're slowly undermining the rationale for the state by replacing it on a very local level with actually functioning institutions. And then the more you do that, the more you can scale up a bit by um, establishing linkages with other groups in different areas, exchanging resources, whatnot here, building larger confederations. And essentially, you make the state obsolete um, uh, by um, replacing all the basic functions we currently take for granted from it. You'd still have to deal with it. Yes, you can't run red lights or whatever. Like, you still got to, oh, yes, the popo is still around. But um, you're building up a way in which on a daily basis, you're not really dealing with them in the same way. Um, and you're you're showing um, that you can get around that. And one of the bigger tricks is finding ways to get past the economic side of it. Because at the end of the day, anarchist co-ops are still working within a capitalist economy. So there's no way around that. But again, as, um, uh, oh, what was the guy that was just up there a, a little bit ago talking about Eastern Europe? Um, as it, it was pointing out earlier, um, all through the Cold War, the socialist economies were still trading with the global capitalist economy. They were still part of the capitalist economy, even as they had internal socialist economies. Think about anarchism similarly. So you're going to have um, an internal, you're going to have a, a capitalist economy inside the United States. That exists already. Um, and that does create certain challenges, like it's harder for, you know, you get loans or whatever, you got to deal with banks and everything else. But the more you move out from that, so let's deal with like credit unions instead, let's build our own cooperative enterprises, let's pool our resources and create more and more co-ops. Co-ops are literally anarchist and socialist. You know, so whether you're talking about like um, like a fresh fruits and veggies uh, co-op in, in a rural part of the country here, or I don't know, there's a there's a big market chain in Southern California that's that that's a co-op, so it's directly worker owned. Um, they 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 exist. They it's harder to create them in a capitalist economy, but they but they do exist, and they are quite efficient. They're they're quite stable entities, and. What you can do with that is you can give people direct experience of workplace democracy. What is it like 
to elect your managers. Oh, this manager's a complete dick? Okay, cool, we're gonna vote him out. He's no longer the manager and someone else is gonna do the job because at the end of the day, manager is a responsibility, not a path to power. And you don't have an owner class, so there's no one taking money off the top. You get to share the, the, the profits directly. So we get to vote. Hey, what share of the profit do we wanna reinvest in growing the enterprise? What share do we wanna take in, our, in, our, in terms of our own wages to help ourselves out? And we're all more motivated to make the business succeed because we share directly in its profit. Its success or failure affects us, where companies that want you to care about whether the business succeeds or not, why does it matter? You get a salary. You're just being paid to be there. You're not invested in it. It's just a job. But if it's if you literally own it, you're part owner of this business and you get to vote in decisions that the business makes, then you feel a bit more invested in it working well and it in it succeeding. And if more businesses exist this way, if you create more co-ops and more direct workplace democracy, then we can start pointing out to people, you know what? That's that scary S word. You know, that's that scary A word. Like you're dealing with like socialist and anarchist institutes. You you like your business, right? You're, you're doing really well. You, you got a good salary. You're, you're taking good care of your kids. You bought a nice big house there. You know why that's happening? Because of socialism. Well, I live in America. This is a capitalist economy. Yeah, but you work for a socialist enterprise. That's why you do well. We've lost that. Unions grew in this country because people understood that unions worked for us against the bosses and our wages went up. When people started thinking about themselves and cutting themselves off and falling for a lot of the propaganda around that, a lot of people are like, I, I know tons of people around here that are proud union workers, but it's only because they get a good wage and there's no socialist for themselves. They don't get it. They don't understand that unions are explicitly socialist. A lot of the, the union base in the United States today is actually quite significantly conservative. Uh, and that's a real problem for us winning these arguments. You have to show them how it works in practice. And we had a stronger left when labor unions were engaged in that struggle, when they were showing people how it worked, when they said, hey, we all work together against the bosses, apes together strong, and we all did better. And people have lost that. And now they just think, you know, oh, well, you know, it's just, you know, fuck you, I got mine. I'm going to pay for my union dues, but it's only because I get a better wage and I don't care about it. And commie bullshit. They've, they, there's a disconnect. And we have to correct that disconnect. And the way to correct that disconnect is to build real institutions again. And, and again, I mean everything from, from co ops as businesses to community policing to real, new, good labor unions. Because a lot of the existing ones are massively co-opted, not only by their conservative membership base, so even a lot of the radical unions in the U.S. can't do radical shit anymore because a lot of their membership votes Republican. Um, but a lot of them themselves are deeply in bed with politicians, you know, with, with neoliberals, you know, like with, with the Democrats or whatever. So they're also not going to advocate real radical change anymore. But new unions can. And the existing legislation that protects the existence of unions, the right of people to organize, can be used to create a new and vibrant IWW, you know? So we don't have to all like sign up with the, the existing big ass unions. You can create new unions or you can revitalize awesome old ones like the, the, the wobbly. So a little plug there, I'm, I'm a wobbly. So, but you know, just <clears throat> if more people were willing to form new unions or, or, or join the old syndicalist union like that and or support co-ops, so, you, know, uh, you know, credit unions, everything else, like it, putting your money in a regular bank versus a credit union, that's a decision. The money's in the credit unions, they're, they're technically member owned. Like that's, that's a, a minor form of socialism. And that's the kind of banks that we would have in the absence of capitalism. So it's good, yo, find a credit union. Anyway, so long rant short <laughs> to, to wind this out. The way I think that we get toward anarchy is to build the new inside the bones of the old, to build alternative institutions and then use the existence of those institutions to show people, look, it already works and you are already benefiting from it. Oh, shit. Okay, I didn't understand. I couldn't tell you how many conversations I've had with self-identified conservative Republicans, and I've explained to them socialism without using the S word. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. That, that sounds fantastic. Like, hell, fucking Ronald Reagan said there should be more worker-owned businesses. I mean, you can, you can sell directly socialistic policies 
to conservatives if you use the la the right kind of language and you show them in practice how it works. So that was an exquisite rant. <laughs> I'm a fan of that. Just a rant. <laughs> um, you said something about ruins and it reminded me of that Derudi quote. Hold on. The one we are not in the least af afraid of ruins. I'm trying to find the bigger quote. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, and I and, and I don't remember saying ruins either. So I'm not sure where that. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm missing. You said a lot that. of words. Yeah, I, and I okay, I have hard remembering what I said, but I, 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 <laughs> I can't figure out what I what context that would have come up in. Maybe 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 building building something within the uh, yeah, the yeah. world kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that yeah that kind of vibe. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Bones of capitalism, ashes of capitalism, ruins of capital. Yeah, any of those, all those work the same way. Yeah. I'm gonna read uh, the quote because it's so beautiful. Cool. Okay. Um, okay, this is from uh, Spanish Revolution, 1936. Uh, we have always. Li oh, it's from an interview that Drudy did. We have always lived in slums and holes in the wall. Uh, we will know how to accommodate ourselves for a while. For you must not forget that we can also build. It is we who built these palaces and cities here in Spain and America and everywhere. We, the workers, we can build others to take their place and better ones. We are not in the least afraid of ruins. We are going to inherit the earth. There's not the slightest doubt about that. The bourgeoisie might blast and ruin its own world before it leaves the stage of history. We carry a new world here in our hearts. That world is growing in this minute. Buenaventura Durruti. Oh, mm -hmm. hey, hey, there's a, uh, there's a CNT sticker on my laptop. <laughs> nice. Um, he was asking about who's in charge in, in anarchism, uh, and there's, <laughs> there's actually a simple, um, answer there. And, it, and, and like the, I, I get where they're coming from and saying like, well, you know, I, I got rid of one tyrant. Now I have another tyrant. Well, the, the trick here around, um, anarchism and anarchist socialism is that you're removing the ability for somebody to oppress somebody else if if there's no ability to concentrate wealth and power if there's no legal framework in which i can own a business and employ other people like if it's not possible because because that's how a, a, for a business to work you need a basic legal framework for it so I, I get a business that that says i can have employees and you you are forced to work because you know wage slavery is the norm here we all have to make money somehow and most people can't employ themselves you know where you know you go back to the 1830s and 95 percent of americans were self-employed but today that's you know it, it's it's like what six percent or something like that almost no one's self-employed so you got to work for somebody else well the trick here is you're removing that logic. If somebody can employ you, they have power over you. So you have to do what they're saying and the way that they're saying because they have really a power of life and death. They can withhold money, which means you can't feed your kids. Uh, so that gives them power. Money equals power. If you remove the ability of people to concentrate wealth, by taking away that legal framework, which is what anarchism does, there's no legal framework that lets them create corporations and big companies and all the labor laws and the rest of that crap, then then what you're left with is the um, the, the worker owned businesses. You know, if somebody needs to to, to work, well, hey, we all got to work somehow. Like, oh, we got to we got to make money or whatever, right? Cool. So when you go to um, apply to work somewhere, you're actually applying to be a part owner of that enterprise and to work for that enterprise. You know, that's that's what you're asking to do. You're not asking, please, sir, can I work for you and please throw me some crumbs off the table to feed me? That's a tyranny. As long as the employer class exists. It's a tyranny, it, very much like the, the financial class is a tyranny or the political class is a tyranny. An owner class is always going to create that kind of political oppression. This is one of the reasons that the socialist economies that formed around like Marxist Leninism and Maoism, they actually reproduced a lot of the same tyranny because they, they simply substituted the state for the previous capitalist class and you still work for somebody. I mean, the Soviets banned independent labor unions and you were forced to basically work for the state in some way. You're substituting one master for another. 
That's the difference between that kind of tanky socialism and anarchism is that you're removing the ability of anyone to do that. It's simply not possible to oppress somebody else because I have to work cooperatively, cooperatively with them in a cooperative enterprise. I have to ask, hey, can I work in your business with you and we'll all work together and share in the profits? And like, no, you look like an oppressive Ayn Rand douchebag. Uh, no, we don't, you can't work here. Like, oh shit, then I'm gonna, you're gonna find someplace else to work with you. You, you but you, you can't force your way into it and no one in the boss can do the other way around. You can like, oh, I don't wanna hire you because you're a bunch of like fucking commies or something. Like, no, you, you can't work here, so you're fired, whatever. You can't. Do that there's no the power relations are absent in that way it's cooperative it's their their democratic decisions by ordinary people so it's who's in who is in charge in anarchism it's direct democracy it's people it's people working collectively and voting and choosing how to organize their own lives that's it hello Callie, did you want to come up earlier i thought you said you wanted to come up because you just said something really cool in the chat about anarchy is inherently matriarchal. Oh, yeah, that's a, um, yeah, well, she decides she wants to, to come up. Um, the one thought there, I, 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 I've always been uncomfortable with the word in a way. Because what it literally means, what oh, patriarchy, me. patriarchy yeah. means is, is rule by one of the other one of the other gender so matriarchy would be women are in charge and men are subordinated yeah um just Thanks. like patriarchy is men are in charge and women are subordinated i don't think that either of them are, are anarchistic in that sense um I, I i think we need to stop oppressing the fuck out of each other but there is a more, more um what would uh, like a like a maternal aspect of, of anarchism that makes more sense that way like so and, and if that's what Kali was meaning, like there, there's a sense of like greater cooperation rather than like competition and force that comes through. Liam, do you know about Ojalan's writings on this? I'll, I won't talk about him a lot. I don't want to like get us in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently social media companies don't like him. Um, no, I, I, I really don't. And in fact, honestly, offhand, I um, short of an essay or two, I can't recall reading anything by him. So no. Um, you may receive some know, links. I'm more known <laughs> of him than 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 him directly. Right. Kelly is here. Hello. I'm nervous. Though. I'm always nervous if I've got to talk in front of people. Hi. Good morning, or afternoon, Hi. evening. Yep. With matriarchy, my understanding of it is though more of a circle than a triangle so i can see how if we stepped over into matriarchy we might have to whip a few men into line to begin with but ideally once you have a matriarchy is those up and coming men are raised within the circle is you are instilled with an integrity and an emotional development that doesn't lead into a patriarchy. So I can understand how the flip side might make people think that men would be subservient to women, but it's not because eventually they're our sons. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the word then. Yeah, it's it's some, it's some of the way that uh, um, like feminism as a word sounds weird to people because it sounds like oh women are in charge. No, no, it, no feminism it just means everyone's equal. But it's using it's using the historically oppressed category you know to kind of like flip things around so that, that, that makes sense i think yeah i, I don't know i just I, I just can't wait for a matriarchy uh that's i'm just sitting here praying for a matriarchy if it's not matriarchy it's aliens either way i'm happy um we just need something different but um i actually did have a question i don't know whether it's your forte but um looking thinking a lot about restorative justice and just um in how we like so i'm in australia if you can't tell from my voice um and just sort of looking at so we have an epidemic of housing crisis here of course it's being spun as a rental crisis because that means that investors can get involved and go oh we need to buy more property to rent when no it's not a rental crisis it's a housing crisis everyone needs a house and with housing being like the most pivotal point of where nearly everything stems from and looking into so of course 
being Australian, I have a little bit of an insight into Aboriginal law here and how they ran things and how they worked and just trying to so don't I didn't have a fully formed question I had a concept of a question so bear with me um restorative justice in the sense of thinking as, of cops as being for the state as we know they are they don't really do anything for the people they just you know they are called into situations which really they shouldn't be called into and they don't actually do for the people what needs to be done and when you scale it all back it comes down to things like secure housing and services which police can't provide obviously and trying to find a way i think it always comes back to emotional reactivity is nearly everyone even though they think that they're not emotional is they always come to an emotional reaction when it comes to things and then those laws and governments jump on board with the emotional side of it and rather than going down to the roots of what things are and really trying to find ways of having conversations with people how to chip away at those beliefs and understandings that come from their emotional response which is always entertaining because men like don't like to think they're emotional but oh my god are they and um you know like we've ridden the emotional dragon our whole lives right we know how to deal with our emotions yet men are like I'm not emotional but hey like, anger is an emotion anger is an emotion rage is an emotion <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah about? And usually like the most default emotion there is as well, rather than sitting with an emotion and how it makes you feel is responding in that emotion because it makes them feel uncomfortable and you can't do that and that's not fair. And trying to find ways of having conversations of how to chip away at these inherent beliefs, well, no, not even inherent, they're not inherent, they're just pushed, I think. They're more pushed than inherent because the, I guess, oh, see, a concept of a question, and I'm trying to ask everything all at once now, but I might leave it at that. I think I've said a few things that might spike some conversation, but yeah, I'm, I get, in Australia, Aboriginals are the most highly incarcerated peoples in all of the world, all of the world. And unfortunately, is most of those people that end up in jail have come out of state housing. So if that's not saying that there is something wrong with how we do something, if our state housing is not facilitating these people to be able to find a more sound way of existing within society, there has to be something wrong. And I don't yeah. know, we're not locking up the bad people, you know, we're locking up people that are to a degree just a little bit of a disturbance they're not really doing the bad things they're doing things that aren't great that usually come from a trauma a trauma response not knowing any better and yeah. i don't know yeah. i we were talking about earlier actually um that this uh, what what people do with that is they'll see oh look we're locking a lot of aboriginal people up that must mean there's something wrong with them whether you, you take it in like racial terms there's something wrong with them as as people or cultural terms well they just need to become more like us or something it, it, it falls into all this weird paternalistic bullshit that's used to rationalize what's causing the problem so you start with a terrible racist ideal that racist ideal creates terrible circumstances in which people fight back against it they're in, they're in, they're in poverty they're generally relationally traumatized there's all kinds of things that are going wrong so yeah they might be more likely to rob a liquor store so when that happens then the police come in and blah 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 and then you have to punish them and then you use that punishment to say ah look that justifies the racism that i started with it's like we we're blind to the causal relations here but people use the way that all these things just confirm their own prejudices you know to keep this cycle going for freaking ever we that reflective capacity is simply not there on a social level that's one thing that could come with greater um emotional maturity honestly and it's interesting that so many people are terrified of that uh and they think that somehow understanding your own emotions and your own self will somehow emasculate you i'm like bro if your conception of masculinity is being completely fucking stupid then okay sure like but 
maybe we don't all want to be stupid. Like it, it doesn't make you any less masculine to be aware of your own feelings and you know able to, to control and regulate your own emotions. You know, it's it's never stopped me from like I don't know, driving trucks and building shit. You know, like I'm still a dude, but I you know I'm I'm not hiding from you know so much of what I am, and and that's one thing that you could see in uh, as a way of connecting the the whole restorative justice you know concept to what you you meant by by matriarchy and this is again a place where the literal definitions sometimes conflict with the way we want to use things it came up earlier with with nikita when we were talking about um the term racism because literally speaking racism as a word means the idea that individual groups of people like categories of people have distinct characteristics and some are better than others so anybody can be racist towards anybody but in the concept of like in in the, in the context of of power relations and and uh, historical white supremacy and everything else we can use racism in a very specific sense and say yes a historically oppressed person cannot be racist towards the oppressors they can be bigoted uh, prejudiced colorist anything else there but we're using racism in a very specific sense. So literally speaking, matriarchy is ruled by women in the same way that patriarchy is ruled by men. But in this sense, what we're doing is we're trying to use um, some more of the, um, I guess, we're, 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 we're flipping it around a bit and trying to, to recenter in society some attributes that people think are more feminine and probably shouldn't think are more feminine, like, being aware of <laughs> what you're feeling for fuck's sake and not thinking that we need to just run over everyone to get to the goal like for me winning is is more important than like all the 50 people i'm gonna squish under my car like it's a very mm, male thing to do uh you know and that getting away from that kind of shit doesn't emasculate men in a way it can it can actualize them it can bring out the best in us you know and a, a kind of positive masculinity but people are terrified of it um so yeah the in this sense i i kind of get what you what what you mean word wise um i i'm not sure um if it doesn't some, I'm always conflicted on those because on the one hand I worry does it give the wrong impression to people and 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 it, can that confuse things and make it harder to actually get to the goal or is it useful to have that direct connection to you know like to uh, to the to the other side there to to flipping the script in a sense um, is that useful too so it's I I can see either way I don't really have a a, a feeling on it but I do think that we've got to find a way to break these these cycles and the one we're talking about with patriarchy is the same thing we, you, that comes up with mass incarceration and capitalism and everything else you know people always use the existing circumstances to rationalize the stupid prejudices that created the circumstances in the first place it, it, it makes it impossible to actually fix anything it's look at all the, the the douche bros out there that are defending toxic masculinity because they think toxic masculinity is masculinity that there's no way to be a real man without wanting to crush everyone uh which just doesn't make any fucking sense but you know it's um yeah the the, the how is to get to that stuff is a, is a hard part i'm i'm always really pushed in that direction but just thinking in terms of the ideas that that's my quick thoughts on uh, one of the problems with getting to real restorative justice and questions like this is getting people to really understand how their own actions are creating the problem that they're angry about. You know, look at all people are like they're upset about crime in cities. Like, cool, you don't like crime? Cool. I don't like I, I don't like when people are forced to steal things either. Why don't we just give people a decent standard of living? Because if if my choice was between selling crack or working at McDonald's, I'd sell drugs. You know, and sorry, TikTok, I said something bad, but you know, if that's if that's your only opportunities in life, that those are your choices. So change the situation, change the choices, give people better fucking choices. That's the 
the, the trick there. But it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around that. They just keep thinking the crime is the problem, so we need more of the terrible, stupid shit that created the crime in the first place. And that's the situation you've got with a lot of the uh, the Aboriginal populations there, and they're they're uh, they're heavily over policed. It just used to justify the racism that was part of the colonial project in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've put a few, <clears throat> sorry, I'm, just, <clears throat> I'm only just talking fresh for the day. I haven't really spoken much today yet, so voice is still waking up. But a few thoughts on that. Um, so within much of Indigenous law here, um, so it's seen as if you do a bad behaviour, that bad behaviour, they've got a big emphasis on shame. You do something bad, you're called out. Shame, you shouldn't do that. That's not what you should. It's instant and it's called out immediately. But within doing that, there's an understanding that a bad behaviour comes from a lack of needs being met. So there's that initial, what you did was wrong, you're called out for it, we don't do that behaviour. Gentle parenting almost, like we don't do that. And then it's, okay, what need isn't being met that instigated this behaviour? And then the community around you help build it because we all have needs in different ways they're met differently we might have the same basic needs but how needs are met individually i might need to be told i'm nice more than what someone else does or whatever those needs need to be met and when we can meet those needs and then there's also uh what's the word uh um, I should have had more coffee. There is a, a bad thing that happens to you. You were told that it wasn't good. You were shamed. Not in a sense that you are shameful. That behaviour was shamed. You don't do it. There's a consequence. That's the word. There we go. Consequence for your action. But then the community supports you. So in and then when something is done that is very bad, that is not forgivable, which is why a lot of um oh oops, sorry, that scared me. Um so if you do something that's rep um unforgivable in a sense, is you are marked, whether that be you are stabbed in the leg, so therefore you walk with a limp, which means that that is recognized to anyone that is coming into contact with you. And it doesn't mean that they're then shunned. It means that they wear what they've done, obviously. And so anyone coming into contact with them is then able to recognise that that's something that we need to keep in check, in a sense, right? So this is my idea of branding people's foreheads. I mark of Cain the side here. <laughs> the mark of Cain. I'm getting distracted by all the noises. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. And there was another thought that I had with it, which I heard a really cool um, concept, which I hadn't heard before, probably everyone else has, but it was copaganda. So instead of propaganda, copaganda. And we're talking about it in the sense of developing communities that support each other. And it was brought up in the sense of a bunch of homeless people living in an abandoned apartment block, right? And all the movies and everything will let us believe that they're all drug addicts, they're bad, they do bad things. Whereas in most situations is they're just developing their own sense of community. They've been taken out of their community, shunned from their community, and they found community amongst each other. And copagandering, cop I don't know if I said that right. The idea that they're all bad druggies doing bad things, all of that kind of stuff, then gives the emotional weight behind cops going in there and pulling it apart. And that, I, I don't know, I, I'm just really baffled. I think I hadn't quite realised how emotional our society actually is. I guess because being a woman, I think we all experience you're so emotional, you need to be more logical and rational, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time as I sit with those and then feel them and allow other thoughts to come in once it's sort of regulated and then realising how emotionally triggered our society and our laws and all of those things, because it's using our emo the emotions of the public to push agendas and i don't know it just baffles me i just it just seems so simple to solve so many things yet we've got to kind of crack these exterior shells of people and go hey just feel for a minute just feel it without reacting 
And then after that emotion subsides, it, it's like, so we had the conversation that we, um, about domestic violence and it was kind of talking about how if everyone had a house, we could stop so much of it if they had somewhere to go. And then of course you have someone that has been a victim within that that goes, no, they don't deserve to have a house. And it's like, yeah, your emotion is valid. I get that. That person that hurt you, you don't want to see them have anything that is good. Uh, that emotion is valid. So have that emotion, but then moving forward, how do we stop it happening again? And if there was somewhere for either the violent person to go in a situation, they could go and it would stop it from happening again. But we have to get through that emotional feeling, which is valid. There's no that is completely valid, but the emotional side of it and then what we do to rectify it are different. But we have to feel it first. We have to validate the feeling, but then know that those feelings don't actually correlate with how we change things. And I don't know, I, I don't know. As I said, I have concepts of questions, not real questions. It's sort of like my own my own musings in my head. Um, yeah, yeah they're all my thoughts on what you said, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I just because I'm just pushing for housing at the moment. We have we have no housing, and it's just devastating. To, and we're middle of winter. I know we all experience it wherever we are, but ours are getting worse. Ours are getting worse. I know everyone's getting worse. I shouldn't. It's not different, but there is different. So I sit and listen to you guys a lot, and because you're so far away and with different problems same problems but different problems you know we're all having the same thing going on but it happens through different ways just because of how things are and i don't know i don't know i just got up and talked that's all i did basically so yeah, yeah no, that's me oh well, that's good and on the housing issue too i I've, I've often um pushed people on this and and struggled to help people understand the rationale between housing uh, about behind housing first you know if somebody is um has lost their home you know this that and the other thing went wrong and they lost their house and now they're living in the streets well that gives you all kinds of trauma you know because you're living in terrible circumstances and eating out of dumpsters and everything you know and next thing you know you know maybe you do something criminal or oh, do drugs or something or other and then people are always just oh well they should be punished for that like no they've fallen into a terrible situation but we've seen over and over again from real world studies like you actually shown if you put people into housing first give them a stable home 80 percent of people get their own lives together pretty quickly right they can they can work through their issues they can get counseling they can get a job next thing you know they're taking care of their own affairs again they're they're fine again and and that benefits everybody if you want to think of it in just cold hard economic logic like they're they're suddenly a productive member of society and making money and blah 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 having jobs and everything else so it seems like a good thing and yet over and over again, I run into Americans who prefer to spend more money because what we spend in policing the homeless is more than it would cost to give all of them a free home. Like permanently, we could just give them a free house and it would cost less than it's costing us to, to send cops after them, but they prefer the cops and they want them because there's a kind of twisted morality behind it. They think that they need to be punished for what they did wrong they're, and they're willing to punish people for the circumstances they fell into. And that I think is another place where um, your um, uh, <clears throat> matriarchal maternal kind of like ideal before might be really helpful there because it helps to short circuit some of that that thinking because that that kind of punitive punishment sort of aspect there is one of the toxic aspects that come out of our particular you know again historically patriarchal political structures that developed in the first place go back to our first human legal systems that dudes wrote were all um, retributive legal systems chop off hands whatever because you stole something it's not like hey let's figure out why did this kid need to steal bread it's like oh he stole chop off a hand and like and you just and it's just all built up from there we never really deal with what causes the problems. So when people tell you they think crime is a problem or homelessness is a problem, most of the time they're kind of not, they're, they're lying to themselves about that because it's not really the problem. They're not really concerned with, with the crime. 
because they're advocating policies that make the crime more frequent. They're, they're, uh, they're, they want to punish people. They don't want to solve the problem. And I think if we can find a way to help people understand how to actually solve the problems, you know, to really correct the social ills, like get to the root of it, you know, stop dancing on the surface, stop playing with the symptoms and go to the root fucking causes and deal with those problems, then everyone gets what they want. You know, all your douchebag righties get, oh, there's less crime, cool, like, you know, and, and, and we get like a more just world, you know, and it, it costs less money to boot. <laughs> but but your st the problem is the morality. And that's the, the key to winning the arguments here is finding a way around this, finding a way to frame it, to, to, to use the right kind of language to get past the moral sensibility they're bringing to it, because they honestly think that it's the more moral action to punish people, and that punishment outranks everything else. So they're, they're, it's not really the problem that what they're talking about isn't the real problem. This is true in so many areas that people get really, uh, I love that you brought up like the whole male emotionality part of it. You think about how emotional a lot of these dude bros get about um, uh, migration or whatever. Oh, you got to control the border or whatever there. Like they don't, it's, it's not the issue at all. Like the, it's, it's all a weird emotional concern that's just meant to make things worse for people. And the circumstances actually cause more people to be undocumented. I mean, policing the border, I mean, the migrant population in the U.S., the undocumented population was really, really low until we started militarizing the border. As soon as we started putting up fences and putting border patrol down there and building all that shit, people who came here for a short-term job and wanted to go home with their money, they couldn't anymore. They were trapped in the country and trapped in this weird liminal status where employers can exploit them because they're, they're afraid of La Migra, where uh, everyone can abuse them and harass them. Them and, and, and treat them like shit where they have to pay taxes. They're paying all kinds of state taxes and sales taxes and everything else, but they get no benefits because they're not a citizen. So they're trapped, but they're trapped because of the fucking border policies. So all these idiots are out there screaming about the undocumented population of the country. They created the fucking problem. This is, this is, it's, it, it affects so many areas, but it, it all comes back to this toxic way of thinking, like this inability to to disconnect from this weird emotional feedback loops people fall into and actually look, what are the real problems? What are the actual causes of this and how can we make it better? That's the one, well, that's something we really got to find a better way to do. So, here's my little rant oh, to end into your rant. <laughs> No, I love it. I love it. I'm here for it. This is what I want to talk about. But yeah, I, that it's, I know you always hear it's not that deep and it's sort of like if you can't see it's that deep, you're not looking like it's all interconnected in some way and it basically comes down to needs being met and, you know, regulating your emotions, being able to be in touch with your emotions, have the emotions and then respond in a sound way and go, okay, that made me feel this way. How do we stop from feeling this way? How do we change the circumstance to stop these things from happening again, you know? But, yeah, I know. I don't really have much more to say. I'll just end up rambling, and I know that you want to close up for the night, and JBS is here, and I think dad jokes are coming. So <laughs> No, no, no. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, I'll let him get going because I know he's got to go. But uh, what up, dude? And Missed I you this no past Wednesday. Hey, Kelly and family. Do, I wanted to, um, so we said the dad pirate joke the other day and it got Arr. missed in the, yeah, no, it was said wrong and it deeply disturbed me. So I'm oh, going to try my best pirate voice okay, and go, go okay. what's a pirate's favourite letter? R. You'd think it'd be R, but it's C. The actual punchline was missed. So I had to, I've been thinking on that for weeks. So yeah. So yeah, Thank that's you. me. I'm Thank closing you, out. Kalia. I'm blushing uh, now. So I'll leave it to you guys. You're good. I can't see it. So you're good. I can't that see it. That sounded a bit Irish, Callie. <laughs> I've got the Irish, but believe it or not, I actually, my grandpa, great grandfather came over to Australia from Ireland. Um, mm. And our farm is actually named after the province that he came from. And 
even so my maiden name has a fitz name like and i'm blonde and i'm pale and i'm very very irish and we did a dna test and my daughter her father's maori so she's my brown baby and we did our dna test because she doesn't know her father and it come back and i had zero irish dna and my daughter had irish dna through her father and it was just sort of like but my maiden name is even fitz it's got the fitz in it i i know my lineage how could i have zero dna and it was like oh that's why dna is shit that's why dna is shit right you did the dna test though we both did we both did well, your yours wouldn't be accurate yours yours isn't going to show the paternal line why wouldn't mine show the real? Well, sort of. Uh, it, it, yeah, but not not all of it. It, it. it leaves part of the ancestry off because of the the chromosomal difference. So, but so, the Irish lineage comes through my mum. Oh well, the, the fit. The, uh, I thought the Fitz name would have been meant from your father. Oh, okay. Sorry, I maybe said that wrong. My mum's maiden name is Fitz. Oh, is Fitz. Oh. And because I, so my dad was never in the picture. I was raised with my mum's son, her maiden name. And then when I got, pardon? Um, is the Irish then still from her mother? or her, her, her No, father? from her father, her father. Her father. Her, but then it passes to you. So, but it passes through her to you. Anything past uh, uh, that his, that his part of it, like her father wouldn't go. So like, um my if my mother does a dna test then um her mother's father's ancestry is not going to be accurately represented it, it's they're not they're not full, they're not fully accurate it's it's really problematic to, 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 to the, the way it works you get some you get some of it but not all of it so it's it okay. to get the best and and the, the most accurate in terms of your you know ancestry then you need to test like your closest male relative and then you get the whole picture on both sides mm -hmm. of it, and all sides of it because otherwise anything that passes once it passes through a woman it loses some of the paternal at markers that can that can pass on so you you're know, saying that the maternal markers are almost more important if we're kicking out the male what bits right i'm joking i'm joking it was my little matriarchal joke there are there are differences <laughs> come through like uh, so um so more, more than mitochondrial dna is is present there in, in women's tests there are different things you can learn from it and in both cases you get like all the health stuff but certain things about ancestry specifically don't come through properly so it, <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. And I can't test male relatives because we got the shit male DNA where males run away, they fail and bail. So we're only left with females. So when I talk about matriarchy, I know it from an like, inherent place it's because all the males in our life failed and bailed. So it's sort of like, well, we kept everything standing. So, you know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But, yeah, yeah. So I can't <laughs> test a male relative. I didn't have a son. So, you know, I've only got a daughter. And But anyway. Anyway, yeah, as I said, I keep on saying I'm going. A, a sibling or, you know, something. And so it, it, it's no, just... I've got no brothers. I've got no, no brothers. No. And my closest male relative would be a cousin. So my mum's sister's cousin. My mum's sister's son. So that would be my closest. But we, we, we I'm not that phased. That. There, there may be, they may come up with better ways, to some other way to do this at some point in the future. But just because of the basic structure of human chromosomes, it does, not all of the ancestry DNA shows up accurately in, in okay. DNA itself. So, but right. but again, you do get a few things that show up in women's tests that don't show up in men's tests. So it, hmm, it interesting. It, we only did it because we didn't know. Well, I obviously knew my daughter's father at one point, but not wanting to be involved, and I let him go because I'm not going to hold anyone to anything. But um, because she's got the moldy lineage i've always felt kind of bad because i can't teach her about that i'm you know white australian girl i can't teach you that culture but if we get the dna test we might be able to find you contacts within the family to reach out because i know that because they don't know about her he wouldn't have told them about her and i know if they knew about her she would be taken in and you know enveloped in the in the culture that she has a right to through her dna through her father and i don't know that's why we did it and it still didn't work so anyway that's all right we just drink tea and sit with our birds so <laughs> all good all good but thank you yeah. for listening to me chat right. 
I'd say though you do still have the Irish in there somewhere. It just it, it just hard to see. Um, no, I do. And it, when I'm not masking, is I have an being... Irish accent that comes out so strong. I just uh, I, my daughter used to always Honestly, go, "Stop talking in that language." It's a huge influence on on, on the way uh, uh, the the Australian dialects developed too, just because of the uh, mostly poor people that were sent. So it was tons of like East Londoners, Irish, you know, tons of people like <laughs> kicked out. The fun thing about you being Australian and having the Fitz name is like. <laughs> it, it tells you something about that you're actually from connected to an Irish underclass too, because Fitz is bastard son of. So it's, oh yeah, it's, I know I'm old poor. From, I'm old old poor. You're descended from <laughs> poor people in Ireland, which is <laughs> that there's something to be proud of in that. <laughs> it's the skills. It's the life skills from being old poor. As I said, I've got an advantage. I know how to live off next to nothing, and we thrive. So hey, bring it. Bring it. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, what little is left? We were going to start stop around this time, so let's see what else is I know, left. and I keep on chatting and taking up your time. I'll let JBS take over. That's, that's what this is all for, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, so, uh, I'm going to say, I'm gonna say good night because I know when he, when he sets his time, it's important for him to get his rest. Uh, I just wanted to come up and say hi, man. Again, I missed you on this past Wednesday. Luckily, Dude, I had a problem with StreamYard. Luckily, I ran, I streamed it on TikTok, so we were able to get the video with Kenny. And so, yeah, yeah. Danny I, said he found a way to to like crop it and, and move the pieces around to try and like replicate yeah. it. So, yeah, but uh, it was a good interview. It lasted an hour. We could have gone for two to three hours because um, Kenny can talk. Uh, but it was good. It was good. Anyhow, I'll let you get. I'll let you get going, man. Good, good to good to see you, Emily, Anna. Uh, we'll, we'll chat on Tuesday back to book club. Um, yep, yep. Hi, JBS. My bird's Not just Tuesday. screaming the phone at you. Say again? I said hi okay. and my, oh. Wait, was Anna talking? Someone was. You did at the same time, I think. Anna? I, I muted so you could talk. Oh, I was literally just saying hi, and then my bird screamed in the phone. Yeah. Don't scream at me, bird. <laughs> good night, y'all. Be good, all right? Stay out of trouble. We'll chat later. Bye. Yeah, see you on Tuesday, JBS. You Have right. a good night. You too. Oh, wait. There's Gabby. We, 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 got, we got all kinds of bird fans in here. I think I saw Tamara in the chat earlier, too, so... We got we got all kind of bird fans here. <laughs> we have we have bird. We have Gabby likes birds. <laughs> we have Emily with her two birds screaming, and then tomorrow with. <laughs> we have uh, Tamara actually requested. Would you like to? Um, oh, I didn't see that. Uh, uh, yeah, if she wants to say good night or something. Yeah, I, I don't. Again, I I got to get to sleep because I got to get up early. Um, but sure, sure, she got something to say. No. Always cool. We get to chat very often. Oh hey, no, I I I I think you misunderstood me, dear. I'm nervous. Like I almost never want to talk on these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think you misunderstood me, dear. Oh, I'm you know that's totally. <laughs> Dude, I just smoked a bowl. So yeah. You know that's. <laughs> I get. Dude, All right. I just smoked. Yeah, well, uh, dude, I just fucking hit the shit. Words? I was really confused. I did it when he was talking. Okay, we're gonna try to yeah. use some code words. I echo. know. Yeah, one, you have a pretty big echo, but two, we're gonna try to use code words. Even if we are a little out there, we're gonna try to allude to what we're doing <laughs> so we can protect the live. All right, I'm gonna mute, and then uh, maybe we'll see if the echo went away and it was my fault. Yeah, even that though, they'll flag you. If you put that in your mouth, they'll flag it. Yeah, I'm serious. Wow, they're terrible. Can I suck my thumb? So, uh, Tamara, did you just want to, you just want to say hello, or just wanted to request, just to request, and didn't really want to come up, or did you have anything you want to throw out there? Uh, 
Oh, you're muted. If you're trying to say anything. Hi, Tamara. Tamara. Maybe she's repacking her fingers. <laughs> Oppo has something to say, I think. What would you like to say? What? Don't do percussion, do words. You talking to your friend? What's so funny? Dude, okay. You talking to your Can people hear me? We can now. We're muted. Wow, weird. Oh, now we get an echo. There's not a bandwidth. So what's up? We just we just uh we just pop on the thing tonight. Uh, yeah, good night, Liam. Kitty. Oh, little kitty. It's a cute kitty. Is it you and your cats, man? You guys are just like... I have pictures of, like, him with the three of his cats being, like, sexual. It was, that was... <laughs> like, when they were, like, draped all over your body at the same time. And that looked sexual to you? <laughs> I was just laughing at that. <laughs> How does that look sexual? <laughs> yeah, that was sexual, dude. <laughs> dude, I'll show you the room. picture. Like you is you'll you'll know what I mean when I say that. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. You need to hang out with me. You'll you'll know what I mean when I say that. Hi. You need to hang out with me. There's such a bad echo. It's like a shoegaze band in here. <laughs> you know, weird. There's such a bad echo. It's like a shoegaze band in here. Okay. It's weird. <laughs> this, is, this is Oppo's girlfriend. <laughs> Oppo is going absolutely manic right now over Minerva. He bit me. He like, he's snuggly. He's doing all this weird shit. Yeah, you can't bite the phone and get the cat out, Oppo. That's not how that works. <gasps> he is attracted to Minerva. I'm 99% sure. This isn't how he is with all cats. Chill out, sweetie. Well, she is a sexy little beast. It's because she's orange and Oppo's orange. <laughs> He's like evolved to be attracted to orange things. Here, you little orange man. I was just thinking about how um, Minerva, oh, um, how soft she is. I was like trying to describe. I was like, yeah, I know two people who have these cats where like, you touch them. I don't know how to describe it. It's like touching down. Like maybe down would be like how soft it is. Yep. <laughs> oh, lady. Oh, Mara, where's your bird? But if he's sleeping, she's a beautiful lady and she knows what good ladies have to do at night. <laughs> oh. A good lady is not awake dreaming of trees. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's trying to what, what, what do wicked ladies do? I wish that I could turn the, the video on because she, like, you would love her. I swear to God, you'd love her. But Ricky, I just, I took her out of the cage now. Yeah, yeah Bucky, that's what I'm saying. We need to have a video play date. Oh, with birds. <laughs> oh, we could just like, oh. Butter he hates the phone. She hates the fucking. I don't know what it is. 
I don't know what it is. All pronouns. Baraki. Oh, Baraki. She was. She was. She's formerly Mr. Burak. No. She's the former Mr. Burak, the prince. Apo, say hi. Say hi to Birdie. It's the big green Birdie with blue hair. Oh, uh, Baraki's the most. You're so rude, Apo. You embarrass me so much. Say hello. Dude, I can hear you. I have a crazy question. Okay. Um. Like, why is it? Like, do bird species are they able to fuck? You should, okay, like, say, like, okay, say you had, uh, like, a yellow-naped Amazon, right? <laughs> Butterkey is a blue-headed Amazon. Could we, if you, okay, a po, a po is a male, right? Yes. Why They're not... couldn't a po and Butterkey, why couldn't far. they mate? Could they mate? No, why? absolutely not. No. Why? Because what do you think of this Butterkey? Yeah. You think that Butterkey does not the abomination that would be created. <laughs> no, it would it wouldn't be. It wouldn't happen though. I think because they're not in the same um what's it called? Like okay, a cockatiel and a cockatoo can. They can what? have offspring. And it's what? nuts and they don't live very long and it's not ethically okay. No right. fucking way. That's true? Yeah, so you know um oppo species. Um, Apo is, what is it again? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know how to say it without getting the live potentially banned for anti-Semitic no. slurs. Um, <laughs> he's a oh. white-bellied parrot. Wait, wait, white-bellied cake. We'll say cake. Uh, oh, we'll say oh, uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, wait, <laughs> like K-E-Q? Uh, C A I Q U E. C I A P. Okay, okay, okay. Go on, go there. What do you, what do you think of all this? Because that's what's important to be. Okay, but here's the thing. Yeah. Also, cannot do it with a black-headed cape. Why? Because it's a super species with two subspecies in it. And no, they but, but, can get it on and they can produce offspring, but it's like not ethical. Like, I think there's like genetic like mutations or diseases or something that occur. I don't really understand why it's not ethical. That's, yeah, that's really weird. Bird know, says you know, that's like, racist. Hey, okay, Liam, Liam, you know all, like, okay, genetics are Liam's forte. <laughs> He can explain the ins and the outs to us. What is going on here, Liam? Why can a I mean, and Miss Butterkey uh, not produce children right. together? The simplest answer is that um, things critters will speciate. They'll become new species through particular mutations that stop them from being um, uh, able to reproduce successfully. That's that's how we define a species. So if they have, if they have drifted far enough apart from another species, they're no longer the same one. If they can't reproduce, that's that's the dividing line is whether you can actually reproduce. And if so, you're close enough, the, okay, wait, it's sometimes so, possible to hold on. The, the, one, one of the part of that is sometimes if you're close enough, and this is sort of relevant to what you're kind of asking. There are parts of it that okay. So think about. Um, uh, horses and donkeys can get it on and produce offspring, yeah. and those offspring will, will grow to maturity, but they're sterile because their their parent species are close enough to fuck and produce an, a child, but not so close that they're the same species. So it doesn't actually work. It, it, it's, not, it's not really truly viable in that sense. Um, uh, this is true too, but like uh, there are um, most of the time when Homo sapiens you know, interbred with Neanderthals, most of the time it would have produced no offspring because we are different species. But we're close enough that a couple of times it worked. 
Um, and that's enough to leave a little bit of Neanderthal DNA still around there. But most of those interactions would not have produced offspring. But if you're close enough together, it's sometimes possible. But the farther you get away, the more you can't do it. And where you get those, those funny places where um, Emily's pointed to some of the places where it's unethical. Sometimes if they're, um, if they're close enough that they can still actually fuck and still find the other attractive, like their species are close. Because honestly, how many of you are really attracted to like pigs and dogs and horses and stuff? Like they're different species. You shouldn't want to. Okay, but like, Neanderthals. But yeah, and Neanderthals are, are like distinctly <laughs> ugly to us, but they're close enough that it might work for some people. But they're pretty fugly compared to you. Know, they're, they're different. So the the key is the. If you're close enough that it's still possible, like Neanderthal's like, oh, okay, I can kind of see that, maybe, okay, and, and you can do it. But you're far enough apart genetically, it could produce really problematic offspring. Most of the times, if somebody got pregnant from a human and Neanderthal, like, well, Neanderthal's a human, too, so Homo sapien and Homo neanderthalensis mating, most of the time it probably would have produced stillborns or somebody with massive genetic uh, disabilities that would die very quickly, you know, or most of the time it wouldn't work and it could be very nasty. Like, why do you want to put people in that kind of situation? They're in a, a, an, you're in a, a tricky spot where you're close enough still to do it, but not close enough to actually do it successfully, like do it right, because you are different species. That's how we define species, though. A species is a different species when they're no, they can no longer mate and produce uh, truly viable offspring. And y'all's birds are wildly different. Papa, <laughs> did you hear that? You can't be with Miss Baraki. <laughs> or for that matter, you know what? Her. <laughs> but that's it. Liam. You understand, Alpha? You, need you can to look, but don't touch. Baraki. <laughs> so, Alpha and Ms. Baraki could check each other out. And maybe they're. they're they, I have they, like a confession that's crazy wild, and I hope that I don't get canceled for this. But when I was a little young girl, I felt a fleeting, a fleeting sexual attraction to our cat at the time. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, like I totally did. It's not. It's actually but I not felt the sexual that... attraction. Some people. I mean, I, 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 I've honestly, I, I knew somebody that, that that let her bird play with her a little bit. Uh, yeah. but, oh, like, Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to wrap this up now. Like, but it's the kind of thing that's like... Is this a fucking you, S&M story? You throw out of that. You're, it's, it's, not, it's not very common. <laughs> and, and there's oh, a good right. reason for that because we're not supposed to do that. But for very young people, it's not that com uncommon. So... Okay, guys. If Thank you, you, if you so felt much. that way now, I would be worried. Yeah, no, I, d I, yeah, I, I haven't. I, but <laughs> I, right. felt, I know I did. Oh, Anna, are you trying to say okay. something? <laughs> yeah, can you guys hear me? Like, I was in love yeah, with that cat. Okay. Okay. Dude, I really was. I was. Okay. This is this is always the weirdest way to end the night. Like, we, we're all a serious shit, <laughs> and next thing you know, like, I totally want to fuck my cat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. No, I was a little girl. Like, I didn't want to. Okay, thank you. I didn't okay. know what that was, maybe. Anna, I'm good right. cop and you're a bad yeah. cop, but neither, neither of us are cop. That, that's no, we're both good cop. That's the problem. It's like displacing something. It's like you're displacing something out of the childhood sexuality or whatever. Like, it's it's not that uncommon, but it, it's definitely something people generally grow out of <laughs> for good reason. Okay, guys, so Anna. I am going to have to, the mods are ready for bed. We are ready to sleep. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Oh, uh, okay. See you guys on Tuesday at Book Club or on um, on Friday again, if Liam is hosting. So I hope everyone has a great night and gets lots of rest. <laughs> also <laughs> with you. <laughs> let's all let's all go play in the grass. Yeah. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Let's all frolic in the field. We'll, we'll yep. play in the ground. I'm gonna right. have some gummy bears. All right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Swedish fish. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, guys. Good night, y'all. Good night, folks. Oh, Dharma, you're there. You were you you, you were lurking. <laughs> I finally saw a comment. <laughs> you lurker. <laughs> Oh yeah, let's see. So let's see. Hey, folks. Catch y'all next time. <laughs>